Written on the pages of the great book of nature lies a truth so profound that it has beckoned men and women throughout the ages to seek its wisdom. We will continue this quest and study many stories of humanity as we search for this light. On this journey, we will examine philosophy, religion, and science to uncover the hidden mysteries behind myth and legend using the symbols of universal Freemasonry. Welcome to Legends of the Craft. Welcome back to Legends of the Craft. I'm here with my co-host, Brother Axel Savari, and today's subject is Charles W. Leadbeater. Famous co-mason, famous theosophist, priest and bishop of the liberal Catholic Church, tried to create the world leader and world teacher, that was the second coming of Christ. He was an occultist, he was an esotericist, he was a writer, he was an enigma. Some people hate him, some people love him. We're going to discuss both sides of the story here today. Yeah, Charles Ledbetter is a really contentious figure when it comes to the world of occultism. On the one hand, he was probably one of the most prolific authors of the early 20th century of that golden age of occultism. Um, much of his work is responsible for what we uh, probably call the New Age movement today. He, I, he is one of the foundation stones of 20th and 21st century uh, occultism and esotericism. On the other hand, he was, very, uh, he was a very polarizing figure. You either loved him or you hated him. Um, but nobody really denied that he was uh, for real. Like everybody that knew him, whether they were an adversary or a friend, would say that he had some real occult power, that there was some truth behind what he claimed. And he claimed a lot. He, he claimed to be able to do many, many things. And uh, some of them may have been true, some of them may, may not have been true. But we're going to do a deep dive on Brother Leadbeater today and hopefully get to the bottom of, of the truth behind some of the accusations made against him and some of the praise that's been heaped upon him. So Leadbeater was born February the 16th, 1854. He was an Aquarius. Um, and, you know, Aquarian energy is that, 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 that mission in life to kind of find out who you are. And um, once you've sort of found sort of a movement and a cause, Aquarians can be quite dedicated, even fanatical. Actually. Fanatical zeal characterizes the sign, yeah. yeah. And it certainly characterized Leadbeater's life. He would do everything wholeheartedly. He, he leaped into everything, um, feet first. Uh, nowhere is that more apparent than in theosophy. He went all the way with theosophy. So Charles Ludbeter, um, the records around his birth, this is the late you know 19th century, well, it's actually the middle of the 19th century, um, but the, the record keeping is not very good. So there's not actually a lot of data there. He actually claimed to have been born sometime up to 10 years earlier than the records show. Um, which we'll get into a little later, but um, so he was born. He, he he would grow up to be like six foot two. He had kind of a, an athletic body, deep voice, very charismatic. Everybody that met him liked him. Um, they may not like what he said or did, but the, 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 he had a natural <laughs> charisma to him, right? But when he the story of his youth are his own stories because there's nothing written, and the stories that he published about his youth are well. It, it, this will sort of describe Leadbeater, uh, and you'll understand this wild imagination that he had, right? So his father supposedly worked for a railroad station, was a director in construction. And Charles Leadbeater and his brother uh, Gerald and his parents uh, had to move to Brazil, uh, where his father was building railroad track. Well, he, he talks about how he's on the train... And uh, some rebels attack under General Martinez. Um, there might be some chuckles here. <laughs> and uh, at one point, he has to take command of the train. Uh, so here's a... At the time, he's claiming to be about 13 years old. But according to the records here, it would have been five years old. He takes control of this train, but the rebels catch up. He's, you know, him and his brother and his father 
are on the train and they get taken captive and they're taken deep into the Amazon uh, where they're tied up. And uh, General Martinez wants them to take an oath and, and then trample on the crucifix, but they refuse because, you know, they're soldiers and lovers of Christ. And uh, at one point, the father escapes and disappears into the forest. Um, but Gerald, his brother, is not so fortunate. And Gerald ends up being killed by General Martinez. And then Charles Leadbeater is supposedly alone in the forest, tied up to a tree. And Martinez really wants him to join the rebel cause and, and fight for the independence of Brazil. Well, at the end of the story, um, the father comes back and uh, starts, you know, this starts this rescue operation with other Englishmen and, and they get Charles Leadbeater and then there's a fierce fight and Charles Leadbeater picks up a sword and he's sword fighting with General Martinez and he defeats him but he won't kill him because he, he will not take a human life and he walks away and Martinez shoots him in the back and then another Englishman shoots Martinez in the back. He's captured and eventually executed of which Charles Leadbeater is at the execution. The best part of the story is that after his brother... <laughs> There's a better part. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, Gerald, his brother, dies, but he immediately, his ghost appears throughout the story uh, in order to, you know, give comfort and relief to his brother from the other side. <laughs> so, yeah, this is no joke. This is a story that he wrote about his youth. Now, there's like two or three versions of it because he was never very accurate uh, with the details. He was definitely a broad strokes kind of guy. <laughs> um... But this kind of vivid imagine, imagination, this this uh, ability to tell a good story, was a hallmark of Charles Leadbeater. And honestly, like it's it's the it's the hallmark of a of a true occultist because in occultism, <laughs> like no no no, I, I know that sounds crazy, but and and for the people that don't believe in any of this stuff, you know, bear with us. Um, but what the magical power that an occultist is cultivating is the imagination. The ability to project the mind into places that other people can't necessarily see. Um, so let, we'll get into this later, but Leadbeater was one of the leading figures um, in the movement to understand clairvoyance and the idea of, of using mental power to see things that are not um, immediately apparent to people. Him and, and Annie Besant um, were kind of a clairvoyant team, and they would go around investigating you know, the astral realm and trying to map it out for people. But this is the... This is the ability that occult practices try to cultivate, whether it's uh, ceremonial magic or religious uh, mysticism or, or even in Freemasonry. The idea of, of what, is, what is it that we're trying to get out of all of this, well, among many things, one of them is the improvement and the strengthening of our imagination because that allows us to see things that the ordinary world cannot perceive. Yeah, I think, I think it's an extraordinary ability that, that Leadbeater had, um, but many people would would point out that what he's what he's saying is not true. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I would look at Leadbeater kind of like Joseph Smith or, or those type of characters. You know, Joseph Smith founded the Latter Day Saint Church, um, and obviously to Latter Day Saints, he's a prophet, and he restored the church on earth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. To other Christians, they see Joseph Smith as a fraud, a liar, a charlatan, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But these type of personalities that form religions uh, or these type of personalities that bring all these new ideas uh, tend to be either loved or hated. And they all have this sort of imagination, this, this, this spectacular, this vast imagination where literally they're making manifest new ideas. But that makes sense, right? Because they're introducing something new to the world. So without an imagination, is that possible? I know people want to believe that it's, it's divine inspiration and all that. And I'm not saying that it's not. But how would God speak to someone without a big imagination, right? So again, we can look at Leadbeater and be like, well, some of the stuff seems embellished. But again, if you look at Joseph Smith... He went on wild adventures. You know, he met God at the age of 13. You know, Jesus mm -hmm. Christ in the flesh in New York. You know, he found golden plates, which became the Book of Mormon. He, he, uh, he translated these golden plates using, you know, a top hat and, you know, an ancient biblical artifact. 
you know, these are fantastic stories. And, and really, all of history is littered with these amazing stories. Like, every religion is essentially an amazing story. I mean, Jesus, right? Uh, Buddha. You take any of these characters, if you try to literally interpret it, it, it would be a bit foolish. Mm-hmm. Well, and the other thing, too, is to remember that this is the 1880s. Like, the... Um the Iron Curtain of Rationalism had not yet descended over the entire world. It was a very different place to live, and it's, it's very, very difficult for us to understand it from where we are now. But the idea that um, the only ideas worth contemplating are those that are upheld by the rational application of the scientific method is a relatively new idea that was certainly <clears throat> coming into its you know, coming into itself at this time, but had not taken over the world or the consciousness of humanity. People lived in a different world mm-hmm. where they believed fantastic stories and lived as if they were true and made manifest their consequences. Like, especially, you know, if you look at the Mormon church, that's a great example, but at, people believed things back then and the world was structured around these beliefs. And there are arguments to be made that perhaps, you know, that... Um, that the world has shrunk since we have destroyed that attitude and that way of perceiving the world. Well, I mean, the idea of skepticism as we have today didn't exist back then. And as you say, people were believers. That doesn't mean that it's wrong or that it's stupid or that it's old-fashioned or inferior. It was a, def- a different way of viewing the world. And I-, I would say it has pros and it has cons. Um, certainly, you know... These stories are like seeing the world through the eyes of children, right? Yeah, very much so. And, you know, there are, as you said, there are pros and cons to that. But Leadbeater, you know, in in his case, he he had this massive imagination. His early life is pretty pretty mediocre, frankly. Um, You know, supposedly he went to... um, Queen's College at Oxford or Cambridge, but neither university has any records that he attended. But but again, I mean, yeah. at the time, record keeping wasn't the best. But So maybe he attended, maybe he didn't attend. Uh, he certainly did work at, for some time as a bank clerk. Um, he worked as a railroad contractor and at uh, ship brokers. Um, but uh, during this early part of his life, his father died. And the records of his father's death says that he was a cashier at a railroad. He wasn't. He wasn't uh, a guy building railroads in Brazil. Um, but he was very close to his mother, and uh, she sort of in- she encouraged him to um, go into the clergy. Um, so he was uh, ordained into the Church of England in, in 1876, and in 1879 he was ordained a priest at St. Andrew's Church in Farnham. Um, so his imagination took him in the direction of of the church and um, he nothing spectacular with his service in the Anglican church um, but I think that that period enhanced his imagination and I think that sort of religious training and working with people how you know he was marrying people he was baptizing people he, he was doing all the, the the sacraments of the church um, he was giving out the Eucharist and etc and um, I think a lot of that probably defined his later work. I think, you know, it's interesting because I think that his experiences in the church actually go on to, um, to, to shape not only the Theosophical Society, but co-masonry itself. I think a lot of the uh, emphasis um, on the proper performance of ritual um, and the some of the the ideas about that and and the effects of ritual that he would develop in um in his clairvoyant phase probably stem from this time in the church as we'll see when we talk about the seven daughters of java for example his his i think this is where his fixation on ritual work and the possibilities of ritual work really starts to develop well he you know in this 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 he's he's a priest he's he's doing um he's doing all this you know uh work of the clergy and um but he he states in in many of his letters uh, to his mother for example that 
he doesn't feel that like the orthodox approach of the Anglican Church, the Church of England, has the answers. The answers. It has some of the answers, but not the ultimate answers needed for, for a person's salvation. And uh, he ends up joining something called the Confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament, which was a virtually secret order that uh, opposed the Protestant hierarchy of hmm. the Anglican Church. So the Anglican Church, for, for our listeners that don't know, like it's essentially Catholicism, but the head of the church is the king or queen of England. and um, As opposed to the pope. As opposed to the pope. And... But there's still there were some Protestant elements, but the ritual was essentially still Catholic. But these forces of of you know Orthodox Catholicism and Protestantism uh, were fighting. So he he joined this this group, this confraternity, which is secret, and they're basically pushing that the Eucharist is um, it's a real thing, like you're really eating the body and consuming the blood of Christ. And that it needs to be taken literally, and that it's magical, and that it has power, and that it shouldn't be taken lightly. Mm-hmm. And so this is, you will really see this when we discuss his, uh, his later years in the, in the liberal Catholic Church. Because one of the very impressive things about Leadbeater is his contribution to the LCC and, and, and the theology behind liberal Catholicism. And it, 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 having, having read the science of the sacraments it, and learning about this confraternity of the blessed sacrament, it's starting to make sense where he's starting to get these ideas from. Because in that book and, and many of his books on theosophy, his, uh, he was utterly convinced of the power of the Catholic ritual and, and that it had been that it was a vehicle that was being actively used and supervised by um, by the masters of the wisdom, for example, or by the spiritual hierarchy, that it was um, that it was something that had active energy behind it and that needed to be uh, used for the evolution of humanity. He, he saw it as, as one of the most perfect vehicles for the spiritual progress of humanity. So being un, unsatisfied with, with the Anglican Church... Um, he started to develop a like for the supernatural and for the occult. Uh, he attended a bunch of seances, which seances, like, in the 1880s was the thing to do. Like, mm. like the upper uh, crust of society, they all went to seances. So this is in the midst of um, what we call the spiritualist movement or the spiritualism mm-hmm. movement. So, uh, And I think, it, if I'm not mistaken, I think it starts with Swedenborg, um, who is a... I want to say Swedish because that's his last name, but don't quote me on that. But Swedenborg is a Christian mystic who um, kind of like opens up um, the Christian world to more mystical ideas and the idea of uh, um, of psychism and things like of of being able to contact spirits and, and like kind of opens up the world to this idea that um, that the barrier between our world and the world of the dead is is permeable and can be manipulated and so and, like, ha- and has its benefits and like you said so seances at this time are all the Huge. rage like Huge. people haven't really heard of astral traveling yet that kind of actually comes from from Leadbeater and the early theosophists but it's kind of like that's the other thing especially for for people that are involved in occultism and esotericism now is like it's really hard to overstate the significance of the fact that none of that existed at this time. That that is all from theosophy. That the 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 fact that we have any um, spiritualistic techniques or uh, any kind of Buddhist meditation tech. I mean, we've talked about this on countless podcasts, but it's, it it bears repeating. That is through the efforts of the theosophists. The Western world did not have anything like this. So, you know, it, it kind of seem it can seem goofy to us now in the 21st century, but like you have to understand that this was a mind blowing spiritual interpretation for people yeah. at the time. Like nothing like this had ever been heard before. And so people really, really got into it. I mean, I think the 21st century is pretty goofy, frankly. <laughs> I mean, this idea that we like look back at the previous centuries, like these people are living in the Stone Age. I mean, technologically they were. I'm not sh- sure philosophically or religiously they were. Um, they're like, oh, the past is full of superstitions. Well, we've just created new superstitions today. So, I mean, I don't... 
Yeah, I don't, be, I don't tend to think of it that the, way. Our superstitions will be debunked by podcast dorks in the future. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, uh, legends of the craft, kind of garbage were they spewing. Um, but yeah, I mean, so he's attending seances, and, and before his mother dies, like he's attending seances with his with his mother. And um, he's not married, by the way, and doesn't have children, and he never does. Um, I mean, in my mind, there's really no doubt that he was homosexual. Um, and so he he didn't have any interest in in marriage and having children um, at that time in history, but he he ends up getting into the supernatural and this his his entry into the Theosophical Society is in 1883, and it's kind of a another little weird story. So he meets up with a friend of his that he supposedly went to college with, if you went to college, <laughs> um, who was the captain of a steam liner. And the captain of this ship was was telling him a story. He was telling Ledbetter's buddy, "Hey, I got the story. I met Helena Blavatsky, and he had heard of Helena Blavatsky. She was sort of the, I don't know, the radical at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, there was so much mystery. She was an enigma, but he didn't really know anything about her. So this this friend of his, who's again a captain of the is a steamliner ship that goes between London and Calcutta, uh, India." was like, oh yeah, I, I, I met her several months ago. I, she was on board my ship and I was taking her to India. And uh, this guy didn't really like her, this captain. Um, but at the time he wasn't a captain. You know, he was some rank below that. And he said there's two really amazing things that he witnessed from Blavatsky, which was, first of all, like, like it was a tumultuous night. There was waves and winds and it was just, it was... Like a dark and stormy inside. night. Yeah, yeah dark and stormy night. It's a great way of putting it. And I guess she went out like on the deck and like lit a cigarette and manifested a flame. <laughs> and everyone's like, how is that possible? Because if you would light a cigarette or anything at the time, it would have been blown out. But she was able to maintain a flame. She was completely calm. And the captain came up to her and, well, again, he's not captain yet. And Blavatsky says, you, when you arrive at Calcutta, you will become a captain of the ship. And he, he blew her off. And when he arrived, when they arrived in Calcutta, he was made captain of the ship. So he told Leadbeater all these stories. So he, he, he uh, requested some documents from the Theosophical Society. And the book that he uh, read was The Occult World by A.P. Sennett. And he wrote to Blavatsky, and he, eventually, he joined the Theosophical Society. But that's kind of his, like, again, like, it's just one of these synchronicities is mm-hmm. how he found theosophy. And it's not a real meaningful story other than if you believe in these sort of meaningful coincidences. Which he certainly did. And, you know, I, I, I won't speak for you, but I certainly do, too. And, and, and this is the kind of... Um, the kind of origin story that only Leadbeater can create, right? <laughs> like, these are these... It's, he lived an almost mythological life and i think he really did live that way like i i certainly believe he believed it for sure i tend to believe it too but i am prone to believing in <laughs> mythology so i i really enjoy that Gee, i mean you're kind of like that either <laughs> right a little bit um so he i guess he ends up he ends up going to a meeting of the london lodge of theosophy and this is this is April the seventh, eighteen eighty four, right? And these are all the the big wigs of theosophy of there. Uh, A. P. Senate, uh, Kingsford, um, all these these names, uh, you know, G. R. S. Mead, etc. And I guess they're having a fight because these early theosophists fought about ideas a lot. And they're having a big fight, and there's of course a full audience. And then this woman stands up in the audience, and, Le- and Leadbeater's at this meeting. This woman stands up and basically harumphs and walks out. And A.P. Sennett, who's a major theosophist in England at the time, ran out and then ran back in and said, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Helena Bavlotsky. And everybody came, you know, running down the aisle towards the door and they all sort of surrounded her. You know, some of them were kissing her hand. Other people were kneeling before her. Other people were crying. And Leadbeater's there. So he, he finally had met Blavatsky and he was, he was very taken by this scene at the London Lodge of, of Theosophy. And later that night, uh, Blavatsky was staying with A.P. Senate at, at his home, and Leadbeater was invited to be formally introduced to, um, to Blavatsky. And from that moment, he pledged his life to her to become a servant 
of, of the spiritual hierarchy. And she encouraged him that if he wanted to do so, that he should write a letter to the masters, right? And, and, and ask to be a disciple. Now, before we continue with the story, we need to talk about the masters a little bit because without you understanding, um, some people probably listen to this do, but if you don't, you kind of need to understand this idea of the masters, the masters of the wisdom, uh, in order to really understand how they play into this entire story of Leadbeater. So the masters originate, so really in order to understand the masters, we're going to have to do a little bit of Blavatsky here and, and kind of explain where she comes from and what she was all about and, and how she ended up in London with all these people in a circle around her, you know, adoring her. So Blavatsky was the daughter of a Ukrainian, uh, not a general, but... He was a governor, I a think. Governor, a yeah. governor of a Ukrainian province in the Russian... It, it wasn't Ukraine then, it was the Russian Empire. Um, so he was, a, he was a regional governor in the Russian Empire. and she, So she was a... Uh, the daughter of a middling aristocrat, she had um, wealth and privilege and access to education. And her grandfather was a Freemason of the strict observance, or the the great grandfather, the great grandfather, excuse me, of the of the strict observance rite. So, and in this rite of masonry, uh, there's this idea that that obedience is overseen by what are known as the unknown superiors that there are based there there are unknown men um, that direct the the course of their masonic work and to whom their masonic work is done so this is uh it's kind of uh would you say it's it's somewhat abnormal for masonry of the day that this is this it's this is not you know Grand Lodge of England kind of stuff. No, this no. is definitely a, an offshoot of that, um, and it's it's a little bit more mystical of an idea that that masonry is part of a spiritual hierarchy that operates on Earth that is kind of funneling people up levels of spiritual progress. That masonry is kind of the base level that promotes people up into the spiritual hierarchy, at which point they become unknown superiors. So she's very familiar with this kind of idea. At, I think, 16, she's married off to some other middling aristocrat, and she's very unhappy in the marriage, and uh, basically goes to the guy and says, look, I'm unhappy. I don't want to make a scene for you. Just let me go. Like, I won't, you know, we won't get divorced or anything, but just let me go off on my travels and do what I want to do, and I won't cause a problem for you. And he says, fine, go ahead. Um, And so she starts traveling all over Europe, all over the Middle East, through Egypt, and eventually she finds her way to uh, to India, to Tibet, I believe, actually. Or, or India first and then is trying to get from India yeah. into Tibet. She doesn't get in the first time. Uh, she gets turned back at the border, but she manages to sneak across. And this is a time when no Westerner has gone to Tibet. Maybe like literally a dozen people from the West have gone to Tibet at this point. Um, so she makes it in. And so from here... All records of her story that we can confirm are gone. This is, we're, we're now entirely on her word. So she says she meets uh, a group of what she calls adepts or brothers of the Great White Lodge somewhere in the Himalayas, right? And she gets taken down into this underground facility, for lack of a better word, where they are safeguarding knowledge from tens of thousands of years ago. And she reads a book, among many things, while she's there training with these people, she reads a book called The Stanzas of Zion. I've heard Zion as well. Uh, And these are kind of an occult history of the world that no one has ever seen. And it's the teachings in this book that become the nucleus of theosophy. And so the legend goes, she she departs these, these adepts with a mission from them to introduce these ideas to the Western world. They, they basically said the Western world has, has advanced uh, technologically enough. They need this spiritual knowledge in order to, to really fulfill their, uh, their dharma in the world of being the, the kind of um, the next great civilization to emerge. And so she's tasked with this mission to go bring all this knowledge to the West. And that's how she ends up in New York, starting the Theosophical Society, and then eventually in England. Yeah, the, the TS is formed, and we call it the TS, the Theosophical Society. The TS is formed in 1875 in New York, and um, there are several key players, but one of them is um, Alcott, Henry Alcott, who was a uh, colonel in the American Civil War. Mm-hmm. Um, he had a lot of money, though. He was also into a lot of seances, got connected with Blavatsky, and he became um, 
the funder for the Theosophical Society. And, and he would eventually become the president uh, even after the death of Blavatsky. Um, but the, the masters... You know, as as you say, Brother Axel, like the, the you know, in in uh, strict observance, right? They're, um, you know, the unknown superiors in Martinism. They're also known as the ins- the same thing. The uh, uh, the I think they superiors say superiors in canoe. Uh, on, on canoe is what they call them. There's the in, in, there's the idea of the secret chiefs mm-hmm. um, or the adepts in Rosicrucianism. So like this idea goes back hundreds of years, um, and and frankly, you can find them in a lot of religions. The idea that there's these sort of uh, unknowns basically directing human evolution. And uh, she called them the Mahatmas, right? Which is, is a Hindu term. I think it means the holy ones or the great ones yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And so the names we're going to be using for these, there's there's several. There's Dwakul, there's Kutthumi, and there's Moria. There's more, but those are the major names that, that you might hear throughout this, this podcast. And these masters, uh, there's an excellent book. Uh, called the Masters Revealed, and it's a it's an academic book that, that takes a look at um, the Masters of Blavatsky. This book was like written in 1992 or 1991, and basically the the theory, and it's a very good one, is that these masters these weren't like some ethereal beings. Th- these were real people in history um, that lived in India and Nepal, but because of who they were. Blavatsky used these names like Kutthumi and Moria and Dwalkul uh, to cover up who they really were. And I, I, I really resonate with that because this idea that, like, look, there, there are these groups of people. They don't want anybody to know who they are because they might have important roles. And for example, one of them may have been the king of Kashmir um, in northern India. And so in order to protect their identities, she's using these names um, but they're not like these magical beings that are floating down. Yeah, so the that, that kind of is what they get transformed into 50, 60 years after yeah. uh, Blavatsky introduces this idea. But at the time, and particularly you know, to make it relevant to Leadbeater, at the time that she's coming back with this idea, for select members of the Theosophical Society who show that they are devoted to this, this uh, path of spiritual development, um, the masters represent a link to this spiritual hierarchy that is available for people to pursue. Like, so Blavatsky's, you know, she, she doesn't make this offer to everybody, but for those that really are dedicated, she says, you know, these people are out here, send them a letter, and perhaps you can, you know, you can join in this spiritual hierarchy yeah. that I've already been advancing along. So for them, it was a very real thing. It's like masonry. You, you exactly. would send an application and maybe you'd be accepted, but you wouldn't. You don't know where the lodge is. You don't know who really is a member of the Masonic Society. It's a secret. And we have these letters. So so at this time, you and I don't personally have them, but these letters do exist. In fact, they're kept in the British Museum, which should tell you something about at least some people think they're fairly credible. But people were receiving these letters. Blavatsky was receiving these letters. Leadbeater was receiving letters. People were receiving letters from people that purported to be these masters. Yeah, you can actually purchase them. They were published decades after the death of Blavatsky, but they're known as the Mahatma letters. And you can you can buy a book. They're a compilation of all the letters. And like you said, they're at the British Museum. Um, again, for some of our listeners, this may seem a little silly, but again, Put in perspective, you know, the idea of the prophets of Israel receiving messages from God, right? Mm-hmm. You know, think of Moses, you know, uh, uh, talking to a burning bush. Like, well, they're, think, they're no more or more, no less fantastic than that. Think of the early Christian communities receiving letters from Paul. Yeah. Like, it's really, it's really not that far removed from things that we all accept mm-hmm. as having happened. Yeah, and so the, these masters play a big part because the spiritual hierarchy becomes the center of this. So... He writes a letter to Kut Thumi, and he receives a reply in the mail uh, some six months later, um, accepting him as a disciple, or the term they use is chela. And this was a probationary period of seven years that you had to show your worth before you could move higher in the spiritual hierarchy. So it asks him that he's, you know, it tells him essentially that he's going to have to sacrifice something. Um, and. At the time, you know, Blavatsky told him to to take over some sections of the Theosophical Society in England. But he basically goes to Blavatsky, and Leadbeater says, 
Well, the master said I need to sacrifice, so I'm willing to go to India to continue the work. I want to go to this mystic East because India is so romanticized that all the theosophists, frankly, all the Europeans look to India as this mystical, adventuresome, romantic place, and they all want to go, but especially these theosophists. So he, along with Blavatsky, he travels um, down to Egypt through the Suez Canal and eventually to India. And uh, when he arrives, um, he converts to Buddhism. And that's the sacrifice that he saw, that um, he had to give up this connection with the Anglican Church. So he surrenders that. Uh, he becomes Buddhist. And essentially, he gets an assignment that is to you know, start schools in the name of theosophy First in what is Adyar, which is the international headquarters that they had created in India. It's basically in Madras. Mm -hmm. uh, Madras. 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 Uh, and eventually he was he was positioned in Ceylon, which is Sri Lanka today. Um, and, and he was given these rundown, yeah. ramshackle accommodations. No bathroom. And, and completely tasked on his own to, to transform them. Um, the other thing I wanted to say here, too, about, the, about converting to Buddhism, you know, because of the work of Leadbeater and Blavatsky, the idea of converting to Buddhism today seems like nothing, right? That seems like it's so easy to do and like who would I even have? How is that even really a sacrifice? Again, the world was a different place back then. There, like, not only was uh, every social convention that he would have been subject to as, as, as a, uh, a citizen of the British Empire... That would be a that that was a very radical act back then to for for an Anglican priest to convert to Buddhism is far more of a big deal than then than it is now. I'm today. I'm sure you have Anglican priests that would say I'm also a Buddhist. You know, I've definitely heard that of Catholic monks saying that they're also uh, that they're also Buddhists. But it was also it was him giving up all of his spiritual knowledge and attainment up until that point. So you got to realize, like, for him to have been a priest. For that many years, like he knew everything about the church, he knew everything about Anglicanism, and, and his entire spiritual identity was conjoined with him being a priest of the Anglican Church. To give that up as a personal sacrifice is a much bigger deal than it sounds to us today, because we don't really, we're not really in a society where people value those kinds of things. But for him to to completely shed his spiritual identity in favor of something else it is a radical act of sacrifice. I just want to make the point that that's, mm -hmm. that's a much bigger deal than we might think it is. Absolutely. I mean, it's, he lives in a Christian world, and mm -hmm. he's given up being a priest in that Christian to, world. To delve into something that nobody else understands or knows about, other than people in India, and who are, at this time, like certainly not seen as equals by the British Empire. Well, and, and, and to your point about his living conditions, he, he essentially spent um, 1886 to 1889 living alone um, in very poor conditions, no bathroom. Uh, he might eat two meals a day, and it was always the same. It was like essentially porridge. Uh, he literally had to milk his cow in the morning to have a glass of milk and milk his cow in the evening to have a second glass of milk. Um he, he lived in the worst, of, and he was alone. Um, his writings are always still very positive, but they're, they're, his writings show like a, a sign of missing, you know, the mm -hmm. West, essentially. Mm -hmm. but, but, he, but he carried on his duty. He, he formed a bunch of schools, and he got a bunch of people, you know, brought into the Theosophical Society in, in India. And, and essentially, he was, he was going through trials and tribulations. This is a crucible for him, you know. He's... He, he thought he'd come to the mystical East and he's eating porridge twice a day and milking cows and dealing with the poorest people that he could ever have imagined. And I think this this test forged who he was. And Blavatsky was always tough on him too, right? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, tough love, right? Like on the ship from London to, to India... Um, Supposedly, she put him through all sorts of ordeals. Like he had to take the chamber pot, you know, that's where people would go to the bathroom, and it was filled, and he'd have to walk around the ship ten times without <laughs> spilling any. And the other, like all these passengers, are just looking at him. He, she subjected him to all sorts of like what we would consider cruel. Um, 
for Blavatsky, it was to see whether he was very serious about this and to refine his ego. And he says that she was essentially very cruel, but that he appreciated it because I guess he was shy before this point, very shy, very quiet. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, through this trip to India, he arrived renewed, talkative, charismatic. Like all that came out on this cruise. Blavatsky brought it out of him. Yeah, I mean, who knows exactly what happened, but mm. there was a transformation, not only from his writings, but from people that knew him, said so that he he had literally been renewed, that the, that the masters, quote unquote, had put this energy into him. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and too, the, this, was, uh, this was a world before, you know, uh, the litigious society we live in now, where like, you know, if you want to walk a spiritual path, then you probably had to accept doing some some pretty gnarly stuff, you know. And and it's it's funny having been in masonry for for several years now. Like people have different styles of learning. Some mm-hmm. people need you know to be broken open that way of of like doing things that are so far outside of their comfort zone that it really tries their um, their determination and their seriousness. Some people just some people learn in, in softer ways, but but lead beater, uh, you know. And I sympathize because I too have to learn the hard way. So, <laughs> <laughs> like I really uh, I really sympathize with that aspect of his story. The one person he encountered um, in in Adia was Sabha Rao, and a, a, a Hindu guy who was in the Theosophical Society and many thought was equal to Blavatsky in knowledge and occult training. Blavatsky, or excuse me, Leadbeater writes at the time that he, the masters came to him. Well, the only person that's there is Sabha Rao. And so there's a lot of ideas that Sabha Rao is actually one of the masters. Um, but his real name was Sabha Rao and he, because he kind of conflates his letters about the master and then what he's being taught by Sabha Rao. And he says he's basically engaging in four or five hours of meditation every day, that he went through 42 days of, of intense meditation in order to bring out his occult powers. So this, this time period, again, is where he goes from being a layman to being able to be clairvoyant and have all these powers. Is this the? This is where he writes about uh, awakening his kundalini energy. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. I happen to have the uh, the quote handy here. Um, quote: When the master materialized in the very act of stepping over the balustrade, as though he had previously been floating through the air, naturally I rushed forward and prostrated myself before him. He raised me with a kindly smile, saying that though such demonstrations of reverence were the custom among the Indian peoples, he did not expect them from his European devotees, and he thought that perhaps there would be less possibility of any feeling of embarrassment if each nation confined itself to its own methods of salutation. So Leadbeater here is knee-deep in magic. Like, his, his whole uh, stay in the hinterlands of India is... is not only a test of his character, but it provides an opportunity for him to meet these these fantastical people that are capable of all this extraordinary stuff. And, and and arguably, probably the isolation and the deprivations are necessary in order for him to complete this this kind of spiritual evolution. And it, and it seems like they're preparing him for later work. Like this is kind of like a like a training montage of Leadbeater, if you will. This whole period kind of accumulates in in. In, in a very good story because he, he meets somebody that will be important for the rest of his life. You know, this is, again, this is like 1889. Um, and he, he dies in 1934. So there's, there's, there's still a lot left to the story. But he, so he meets a young boy, Jinnajay Radasa, right? And um, in his theosophical work in, in Cylon. And he thinks this boy has deep insight and occult powers and he wants him to go to England to go to a university there uh, to be trained in, in English and in and, and all the, the arts and sciences that he could be of real use to the Theosophical Society. Well, Jenner Gerardas' parents, they don't want this. They don't want their kid going. So he, he concocts this whole plan where he... He doesn't kidnap the boy, but the boy meets him. He puts him on a schooner. The schooner is supposed to be going to England. Um, the parents freak out. They alert the local authorities. 
and um, the parents meet up with Leadbeater. The father has a revolver in his hand. He's about to he's about to shoot Leadbeater. Leadbeater's like, "Whoa, he's on the boat! Uh, don't shoot me!" And they're like, "Okay, look, if you if if he if if our, if our son comes out, we'll we'll give his blessing that you take him to England." And they did, and it worked out. And he ends up taking Jenna Jaradasa to to London, and I think he goes to Oxford. Well, this child will grow up to not only be a prominent figure in theosophy, but in in co masonry and the liberal Catholic Church, and uh, I think he eventually becomes one of the presidents of the Theosophical Society. And yeah, this, in the fifties, yeah, yeah, I think he does in the fifties. And, and so this is like this is one of these things where Leadbeater. He, and we'll see this again, but he finds people and he and he says that you know through his clairvoyant powers that he can see how important these people are going to be, and they end up being important. Now maybe he made them important, but still it's just uncanny this ability where he just finds some poor boy in Ceylon and Sri Lanka, and then he does he goes through this entire effort where he's almost shot to get this boy to go to England and. He becomes in a very important person. Well, there's there's two sides to that. Like, yeah, maybe he he makes them an important person, but but to be the kind of person that Gina Jaradasa was, like, that's that requires some natural talent. You can't just train that into somebody. Like, there there does have to be some kind of like underlying gift or talent where uh, you know an uneducated Indian peasant boy can go to Oxford. And, and graduate and like yeah. become like that's not not just anybody can do that and and I don't know I you know I I, I err more on the side of believing Ledby than, than I don't but he really did demonstrate this ability several times throughout his life yeah so the best part of the story is that Ledbeater said that when he found Gina Zeradasa that he had identified him as his brother Gerald the brother that had died in Brazil at the hands of General Martinez. And so he he found his long lost brother, and they had been reunited, and they'd be working like, together towards the perfection of humanity. And this is something that Ledbeard will do uh, throughout his life. He's, he's constantly identifying reincarnation. So so he he, he kind of comes up with this idea, and we'll see it later on in his his life that the Theosophical Society is a group of people that have have been working towards this goal throughout history. So, you know, he'll tell people like that they might have been key historical figures that advanced something or that, that basically this group has always been together and they just keep coming back lifetime after lifetime to work again. So now that he's got his, his reincarnated brother at his side, uh, he returns, he's summoned um, back to England by the Theosophical Society. And uh, the year's 1890, and he meets Annie Besant at A.P. Senate's house. And Annie Besant is a critical figure in Leadbeater's life. The two of them form sort of uh, an unwritten alliance, an unwritten um, contract with one another. They really become partners yeah. and co-workers. It's, it's very interesting. They, they're extremely close. They never attacked one another. Um, they they were always working together no matter what difficulty one or the other was having. And um, at first they didn't like each other, and then they were sort of inseparable uh, after this meeting at AP Senate's house. And it would forever change everything, including, you know, co masonry because uh, Andy Passant will have, you know, she'll become a mason at a certain point and then introduce Leadbeater later on. And then that's how he becomes a Mason. Yeah, Annie Besant's a really pivotal figure in, in both organizations. She's a very interesting character. So she was the, uh, I believe, the wife of a minister originally, kind of like you know a young marriage, typical at the time. She gets married to a minister, um, becomes very unhappy. I don't know if they actually filed a, a legal divorce or if they just separated. But um, so she separates from from her husband and kind of goes completely the opposite way. Uh, becomes an atheist, uh, socialist. She's a leading figure of the Fabian Society, which is a socialist organization of the 20th century that's kind of working to implement socialist labor reforms and things like that. And she eventually um, she gets remarried to uh, to a guy, and they start working as campaigners for birth control. So. Again, the world of 1900 is much different than the world of, of 2022. 
uh, birth control was a very, very taboo subject. It was not something that was even legally allowed to be distributed. Um, they actually end up in jail um, for distributing birth control information. Um, so she's kind of like, she's, she's working for all these like secular kind of humanist type causes um, for a lot of social reform and things like that. And then one day, uh, Blavatsky actually comes to London to speak. No, I'm sorry, she doesn't meet Blavatsky yet. Before that, she's asked to write a review, a review of, the secret, of the secret Doctrine for a magazine that she's working for. And so she reads the book uh, in order to write the review and becomes captivated by it. And eventually she does meet uh, Blavatsky in London at a lecture, and she becomes a devoted theosophist. And it's, it's very interesting. As soon as she joins the Theosophical Society, she completely cuts ties with, with the organization she was involved with. She's no longer a labor organizer. She's not an atheist anymore. She leaves the Fabian Society, disavows socialism, and completely throws herself into theosophy. Shortly after that, she becomes a co-mason and starts, and I believe, the first co-masonic lodge in England, uh, the Human Duty Lodge. Yeah, so she she meets someone called Francisca Arendale, um, who is a member of Le Droit Human, and um, she's initiated in 1902 in Paris. Um, in 1903, Annie Besant opens uh, a lodge in London called Human Duty Lodge Number no. 6, and she selected seven top theosophists in the London area t- to be part of the project. Um, I, we don't want to get too much into this, you know, because mm-hmm. we should probably do an, another podcast on Annie and Hassan. Hassan and all these people. Yeah, they're definitely but, worth it. But in any regard, she would form this lodge in 1903, and um, she would they would write something called the Dharma Ritual, which is the ritual used in co-masonry. Um, people accuse it of being a theosophical ritual. It's not. Um, that's a bunch of nonsense. But she started lodges all over the world, and then Leadbeater would end up joining in, in 1915 um, and be a mason until his death in 1934 and have a huge impact. Um, but in any regard, she met Annie Besant. Blavatsky is is um she dies in 1891 i believe and annie Besant, um the theosophical society is divided into two branches there's the the re- the regular society and then there's something called the esoteric school and that was like the inner school for the most devout and the and uh adepts and, and the cellas in in theosophy so Annie Besant, uh, after the death of blavatsky becomes the head of the es esoteric school in all caught is the president of the Theosophical Society. But Alcott will die in, in 1907, and Annie Besant will become both the head of the Inner School and the Outer Theosophical Society in 1907. And this is around the time when uh, Leadbeater and Besant really become a, a powerhouse in terms of their output. So in addition to being very close and, and assisting one another in the leadership of the society, they were creative partners. They, I think they wrote almost a dozen books together. Um, and this is really, this is Leadbeater's heyday. So he's writing um, The Astral Plane and Thoughtful. He's really kind of the, uh, for lack of a better term, the, the propaganda powerhouse of the Theosophical Society. He starts writing so much literature. And it's not just the books either. I think he's a regular contributor to various like Theosophical magazines. He's writing pamphlets that get given out to people. Like a lot of... A lot of what people know about the Theosophical Society and the information that was kind of really picked up in the middle of the century and kind of became the New Age movement, a lot of that is Leadbeater's ideas. A very, very good chunk of that is Leadbeater. Um, So he becomes very much an in-demand speaker. He goes on tour in America, I think in like 1900. He starts touring around and giving these lectures. Uh, That's another thing that we don't really uh, have in, in our day and age, but uh, entertainment back then instead of listening to a radio show or a podcast you'd actually go listen to whoever it was speak about something and so he becomes very much in demand and he's going all over the world uh, for about five or six years kind of spreading the good news of theosophy and here enters the first scandal the first trial and tribulation of uh, charles Ledbeater. um In 1906, Helen Dennis, who's the corresponding secretary of the Esoteric School in the United States, uh, sends a letter to Alcott um, accusing Leadbeater of um, 
immoral activity. And um, we're going to have to spend a little bit of time around this because this is probably one of the, the biggest things that kind of ruins uh, Charles Ludbeater's legacy is this accusation of um, immoral activity with young men, you know, teenagers, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old. And it's something that would follow him throughout the rest of his life. And today, you know, I've known people that thought everything that Ludbeater wrote was great, and then they find out of the accusations, and uh, suddenly they take all the books they have on Ledbeater and throw them in the trash, right? Mm-hmm. They want nothing to do with Ledbeater because he's a pedophile. Um, so I, I think we should probably spend some time here and kind of get into the nitty gritty of what these accusations were mm-hmm. and what was the outcome of them. Um, so Helen Davis, she had a son, right? Helen Dennis. Uh, sorry, Helen Dennis had a son. Uh, and so there's, there's Helen Dennis and then there's... Um, uh, another lady who has another son. So these these two guys, these two young boys, who essentially um, they tell their parents that you know something weird happened with Leadbeater, and, and Leadbeater leads a lot of kind of like um, a lot of the groups of the young theosophists. Mm-hmm. So he, he wrote a book on on the the proper theosophical methods for yeah, raising young children and all exactly. That stuff. Yeah. And and so he he had a lot of contact, and, he, and that actually goes back to when he was an Anglican priest. He did a lot of. Um, Activities with the with the young kids. So, uh, essentially, the accusation is that he was teaching children to masturbate instead of having sex. Now that doesn't sound too crazy, but in you know 1900, United States, Europe. This is this is the high Victorian age, right? This this is a world in which masturbation is referred to as self abuse. It, it is a it is an absolute social taboo to even like we said, Andy Besant went to jail for distributing literature on birth control. That's the world that we're talking about here, and this is particularly intense in America. So at the time, you have uh, the Comstock laws are happening, and this is a really interesting period in American history that nobody really knows about. But uh, I think his name is Anthony Comstock, if I'm not mistaken. He's this uh, social Puritan that gets himself appointed the Postmaster General of the United States. And he literally start, he starts personally, and with a gigantic organization, personally inspecting people's mail to make sure that they're not talking about sex or sending information about contraception or talking about sex or, or distributing any literature whatsoever about sex, and this is a this is a very uh, it's a very odd time in American history. But like literally, like no information about sex, masturbation, anything like that was allowed to be communicated through the mail, and it became he he had several laws passed that made it a felony to do so. So this is the kind of this is the world that you're talking about in which these accusations are made. What might seem, you know, perhaps inappropriate to us now, but certainly not a crime was the height of scandal at the time that this happened. Well, you you know the wives' tale of like, you know, if you masturbate, you're going to go blind. Mm-hmm. These were things that were taught at the time as scientific as, facts. As medical facts, and, yeah. And I may not have the, all the facts correct on this, but I think graham crackers uh, was like, they, they would help you not masturbate. So your beloved bowl of Kellogg's cornflakes were developed... Uh, to cease masturbation activities in yeah. young people because Dr. Kellogg in a hall of his genius thought that um, that bland, so that he thought that passions were excited by exciting foods and that if you ate anything with flavor in it you would be driven to madness of masturbation. So he he create he set out on a mission to create a, a array of the most bland foods imaginable so that none of the peasants that he wanted to keep down <laughs> would ever th- dream of masturbating because I mean dude I I got to say like if all I have in my life to eat is bland porridge like foods I'm gonna find my excitement elsewhere. I don't. I think that might have backfired. Or you might be on the path of being a cello to the masters. Maybe in order to be a yeah. cello, yeah, you need to eat nothing but cornflakes. Yeah, you know, <laughs> porridge and you know, a glass of milk every morning. Um, but yeah, this is the this is the high Victorian era. So like, what he's telling these kids is, look, uh, don't go to the local brothel. Don't don't engage in prostitution. It's if you have these passions. That it's better that you masturbate than to debase yourself by engaging in sexual acts with with strangers. 
essentially. And I believe, if I'm correct, he was never accused of having physical contact with any of these children. Not yet. In, in this round here, it's, it's that he's giving, he's leading these children down a dark path. Mm-hmm. Today, this would probably be considered good advice. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, leading, you know, uh, experts with, you know, I, uh, would I, tell you that, yes, it's, it, if you don't want to contract a, you know, a... a an STD or whatnot, it's better to masturbate. This probably isn't too far from a fifth grade sex ed curriculum no. today. But back then, it was it was a big deal. And it became a huge scandal. It became a huge, huge scandal on the theosophical side. To the point that there was a trial uh, in London, and he, and he had to defend himself. And so there was like, these letters between him and the children that he was corresponding with and with his instructions. And he admitted to it. He never denied it. He never lied about it. He just said, well, this is what I'm teaching them, and I think this is the right thing. And he is um, forced to resign from the Theosophical Society. Um, and that's not the end of the story, obviously, but this is, this is a big thing. And you can find the transcript of this um, trial online. Actually, and we have a little bit of it here to kind of share, so... So why don't we go back and forth? You can be Leadbeater, and uh, I will be J.R.S. Mead, uh, another famous theosophist and occultist who was a great writer at the time. Um, and you can kind of, you guys will be able to get a, a general gist of how this trial went. Since Mr. Leadbeater was teaching these boys to help them in the case of need, considering that main men may be in the same difficulty, has he ever taught this to any grown-up men? Has he taught the same thing in the same personal way to grown-up men as to children? I believe that at least on two occasions in my life, I have given that advice to young men as better than the one generally adopted. Since you came into the society? I think not, but one case might have been. You are probably not aware that that one at least of the great church organizations for young men deals with the matter in the same manner. Do you deliberately say this? Yes. What is its name? I'm not free to give this. I heard of the matter first through it. Mr. Leadbeater states, then, that there is an organization in the Church of England which teaches self-abuse. Is it seminary for young priests or a school? It is not a school, but I must not give definite indications. Is it found in the Catholic Church? I expect so. I know that in Italy, Garibaldi found many terrible things. This last statement of Mr. Leadbeater is one of the most extraordinary things I have ever heard. It is incredible to me that there is an organization of the Church of England which teaches masturbation as a preventative against unchastity. I ask, what is the name of this organization? I certainly should not tell. I understand that there is an organization pledged to secrecy, and I take it that Mr. Leadbeater received his first information from this organization. I suppose it would have been better if I had not mentioned it. I absolutely refuse to believe that this is so. I decline to prove it in any manner. So that gives you a kind of an, an idea of the tone of this trial, that Leadbeater is, is sitting before some highly offended, indignant Victorian men um, being questioned on this thing. And, and I think it's interesting, that exchange right at the end there, where it's like, I don't believe this. Well, I declined to prove it to you. Like, it, it was still kind of a, uh, I don't know, there was some uncertainty to it, but Leadbeater certainly had a side to the story. Well, he admits to having taught them this. Um... So he, he resigns, and that's about 1906. Olcott dies in 1907, who presided over the case, um, so about a year later. And then Besant becomes president of the Theosophical side, of the, the outer side. She was already head of the inner side of the esoteric school. And um, in 1908, Besant begins arguing that the society doesn't have a moral code that it doesn't have the right to judge people on, on different forms of morality. Bit of a relativist uh, introduction of philosophy there. And um, in that, she basically she calls whatever council was the power at B at, in, at that time to reinstate Leadbeater, and it votes to do so narrowly, but mm-hmm. they, they reinstate Leadbeater in 1908. And... The ordeal is explained as, you know, he, he had taken on being, you know, a probationary to the master. 
and um, that this ordeal was sort of the final test to see w- whether he was worthy, mm-hmm. and whether he could survive um, these public accusations and his name being trampled on. Um, and so he becomes a member of the society, and though, th- again, this will come back to haunt him several times, his fame continues to grow and mm-hmm. grow and grow. Yeah, he's accepted back in, and at this point he, he doesn't... He doesn't quite resume where he left off, but he's still a very important figure in the society. And, and he, um, I believe this is, this is where he goes back to India, correct? Mm-hmm. He goes back to Adiyar, the headquarters. And, and I think he, he spends some time as the headmaster of the school there because the Theosophical Society set up, um, set up a school to, to kind of like, they, they would, they would, this was a hallmark of the Theosophical Society. So they, they thought beyond themselves. So they, they had the Theosophical Society that was like this organization for adults, right? But they would always set up these kind of these youth programs to kind of Summer get camps. people into, into thinking this yeah. way so that they, they grew up with it as a, as a normal part of their everyday life. A year after his reinstatement, he's at he's in Adiar and uh, he's on the beach. This is this is the next phase of amazing stories of Leadbeater. <laughs> so he's on the beach at Adiar, you know, uh, in India, and he's with Ernest Wood, another important theosophist. And there's they're there, they're watching the kids play in the ocean, people taking walks, and there's a child playing in the water, and Leadbeater looks over to Ernest Wood and says, "Who is that?" Oh, that's Krishnamurti. That is a very special boy. And Ernest Wood says, No, that's a very dim-witted boy. He's and, the son of the of the groundskeeper of, at Adyar, right? Yeah, yeah. and it's so this very unremarkable boy, uh, clumsy, not very intelligent, um, not even a cute kid in any way. At least that's how people described him at the time. Um... Leibniter says, this is a special person. This person will be a, a world teacher. He will, people will know him all over the globe, and they will learn at his feet. And nobody quite believed it at the time, um, but he quickly went and communicated with Basson, who was back in England, and said, I have found the next incarnation, essentially, of Jesus Christ. So in theosophy, they have this idea that... Um, one of the masters, known as Lord Maitreya, um, is basically the incarnating power of all the, all the spiritual leaders uh, of the world. So Jesus Christ is Lord Maitreya. Um, Krishna is Lord Maitreya, etc. And uh, at this time, in, in 1909, there is no world teacher. You mm-hmm. know, there's, there's no major religious figure on earth. But that Lord Maitreya was getting ready to incarnate into a, into a new body... And it would be the body of Krishnamurti. So it's the proper titles, Lord Maitreya in the vehicle of Krishnamurti. Mm -hmm. And that this world teacher would usher in the age of Aquarius. And it would be an age of peace and prosperity. Now, before we get into the the world teacher movement, which which kind of... um, It's a turning point for the Theosophical Society, and we'll see why, but... So this is another great example of Leadbeater's uncanny ability to select people that would actually become power important. of clairvoyance. So and it's and you know how much of it is Leadbeater actually being able to see you know these people's ability and their future, and how much of it is you know his special attention being placed on these people that makes them great. I think it's a mixture of both, but. Jiddu Krishnamurti does become a world teacher. Um, he doesn't really follow the path that the theosophists lay out for him, as we'll see. Um, but he remains close with, with Basant and Leadbeater throughout his life. And in the end, does become a world teacher. Jiddu Krishnamurti is a very, very well-known figure in the esoteric world. He's a huge figure in the New Age movement in the 60s and 70s. Like People from all over the world would go listen to him talk. He was... He was a very in-demand speaker, like almost right up until his death. He wrote a ton of books. Like he, he did become this esoteric philosopher that has touched the lives of millions of people. So again, it's another example of Leadbeater's ability, whether whether it was through his work or through the actual you know natural talent that he was able to perceive. He did. He was able to pick these people out. 
So here comes a little theology on on theosophy before we can really get into the story of Krishnamurti. So they believe in a spiritual hierarchy. They believe in master. So they, they, they believe in a plan of evolution. So they believe that essentially the universe began as in, in a state of, of pure energy and, and, and spirit. And as materialization took place, as um, energy became matter, that there was the mineral, then the vegetable, then the human, excuse me, then the animal, then the human, the superhuman, the planet, the galaxy, okay? And they, they call those lat latter two the planetary and the galactic logos, for example. So there's this idea that we, as individuals, our souls will continue to incarnate in a human body, but we were once were animals and vegetables and even mineral, that they, they have consciousness, even though that consciousness is pretty minimal, a stone still has consciousness. And then we will become the masters, and then in turn, we will continue to evolve. So it's, it's an eternal progression, right? Um, and you eventually become a planet, and you become a galaxy. And, well, we don't even know what's beyond that, but that, that's what they have written about. But as humans, and, um, and for our planet, above the animal, there are essentially nine levels of initiation. And these nine levels is uh, how the souls eventually like you live a life over and over again but once you've overcome what you were supposed to learn you move to the next level and that's basically these are the portals of initiation so the theosophists believe that some of them had become disciples or cellos as we've discussed and the first three levels of those nine initiations are probationary you're just learning and being tested to see if you if you can overcome the human state then you have the fourth initiation, which is called Arhat, which is the Buddhic plane. So that's this, these are these are basically like you're still human, but you now ha you're I wouldn't say you're spiritually perfect, but you're you're one of the the spiritual elect. Mm -hmm. You've you have reached a level of evolution that doesn't allow your soul to go backwards, and and that's and that's an idea that's in uh, Buddhism that was adopted by Theosophy. So like your your soul persists from lifetime to lifetime and it, it started in a like as a crystal right like it started at the lowest level in in at the very beginning of the materialization in the universe but as it progresses it become it, it it the way you can think about it is like it basically becomes too large to fit in the forms that it leaves so as you pass out of the mineral kingdom into the vegetable kingdom your plant soul so to speak cannot go back and become a rock soul because plant souls are more complicated yeah, than you're not going to get reincarnated as a worm next well, you're not life. going back as a butterfly yeah. because because a human being's soul is too complex to fit in the forms that it has yeah. evolved out of so the arhat for example it's a form of human being that's more evolved than you know what you and i are so once you've reached that point you can't go backwards you can only go forwards and that's kind of their uh, perception of spiritual evolution through reincarnation is that you're moving forward at a very kind of almost imperceptibly slow pace because it takes most of us a very long time to make this evolution. The probationary page is like what we call masonry. Those that have entered masonry are probationaries. They're yeah, probationaries. This, this is not the, the true mystery school. No. This is what prepares you for other yeah. things. And those that kind of wash out of masonry, they believed, or were those that weren't worthy of continuing uh, to the next gateway of initiation so the fourth initiation is arat and then there's ashka which you basically become a superman um this is very nietzschean in some ways this and so this is where the masters of the wisdom hang out they at the at the fifth initiation that they like that they these are they were once men like you and i or women they were human beings basically that reached a level of spiritual evolution that they now have abilities that you and i don't they can see things that you and i can't they can go places that you and i can't um and it's it's not that they're you know they're not special they're not gods they're not you know um celestial beings that have descended down to this planet just to play around they're they're human beings and the reason they're still here is that the idea is once you reach that level of spiritual evolution you kind of you have to commit yourself to to serving other people in that same progression and that's why they're they're still kind of on the earth and and hanging out and and helping people the sixth initiation 
is for only seven. There's only seven at a time. So seven of these supermen, these masters, um, become basically the, the masters of the inner government of the world. And so for those that are familiar with like Alice Bailey and whatnot, they believe that there's seven rays or that there's seven types of people on the planet and that one master rules over you know, one group of, of, of persons. So, for example, the seventh ray is the, is, the, is the ray of ceremony, order, and hierarchy. Uh, that includes all esoteric orders, occult organizations. And so the seventh master, um, which used to be the Count of Saint Germain, would, you know, rules over those type of organizations. But like the first ray, uh, which is like will and power, that master, which I think is Kuthumi, rule over that, are, are the like essentially like politicians, mm-hmm. generals, and, and, and people that use their will and power. So all human beings basically fit into seven camps. Lord, and Ma- Lord Maitreya. They each a, have a lord. Lord Maitreya is a chohan of the devotional ray. So he rules over religions and churches and things like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, so it's kind of it's split out like that. So within the sixth initiation, you have the seventh initiation. Which is the three principal officers of the government of the world. and These the, are the Maha Chohans. These are the Maha Chohans. And th- these three, like kind of like in Mace where you have a master, two wardens, three masters rule the same, right? And so you have basically the, the Maha Chohan the, the, that would be the master, and then you have the Manu and you have the world teacher, right? And these three, um, it's essentially civilization, is the Maha Shohan, and then the his senior and junior warden would be, you know, religion and science, mm-hmm. intellect and faith. Yeah, and and by by the triangulation of these powers, the world is carried on. So the the theosophists believe that that like what we th- what we perceive as kind of disconnected geopolitics and the the kind of chaos of the material world of people like running around and doing stuff is actually being directed from a very high level. Now, they're not intervening at every moment. You know, every world leader doesn't wake up and receive his orders from the Maha Chohan. Be a great world if they did. But that but that's too easy. Like that doesn't that doesn't create a world in which people can evolve. If if somebody's just telling everybody to do the right thing and they always do it, well then there's nothing here for us to learn. Somebody's just doing it for us. Um, so they're kind of they're directing much larger um, and slower moving force so they, they deal in they're essentially immortal and they're dealing in terms of centuries and millennia as as opposed to the individual human lifetime yeah this this whole theory of evolution kind of hinges on darwinistic evolution but but for the theosophist the real though there is physical evolution of form of, of animals and bodies and plants the real evolution is spiritual evolution and they felt like that, that that Darwinistic evolution is essentially it's just materialistic and it's missing the other half of the puzzle, which is the spirit and how does the spirit evolve? And so this is the system that they have deciphered uh, from from essentially millennia of spiritual teachings and, they, and, and direct information from the masters. Well, exactly, and and that leads actually to the eighth initiation, which is you know it's 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 Buddha. Um, but it's essentially that's that's the that's the stage of, of pure enlightenment, right? And um, there's I don't know if there's more than one, but again, there's very few people going like, like these positions aren't forever. Like you know, people mm-hmm. fill them and then move on. But that leads to the to the ninth initiation, which is the Lord of the World. Okay, uh, which they they use a Buddhist term, Sanat Kumara which is supposed to be essentially the king of kings, mm-hmm. right? He's the king of our world. There are other lords of the world on other, uh, other planets. And so this is another interesting idea. This, a lot of this intersects with Mormonism, frankly. But mm-hmm. like, there's a lord of the world over Earth, but like Mars had a lord of the world and Venus. And they actually believe that the seven planets of our solar system, each in turn, have gone through an entire evolutionary cycle. Which is interesting because if you read scientific studies on Venus, they're like, oh, Venus used to be like Earth, 
And now it's just really hot because of the ozone layer and, and, and the atmosphere contains all the heat. But it probably once was like Earth. There's that speculation. Mm-hmm. And the that, same speculation is made of, of Mars, exactly. too. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So there's the idea that like the Earth is just one of seven um, planets that have evolved in this solar system. But in all the other solar systems, this same type of evolution is going on. Because eventually the Lord of the World becomes the planet and then the galaxy and so forth but the lord of the world is our god Mm -hmm. so all of this to say (laughs) the reason they picked out jiddu krishnamurti and what they had in store for him was that he was to be the vehicle for the for the uh incarnation of lord maitreya and 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 it's interesting that um most of the theosophical society makes this pivot right they, they say like this is the road that we're going down there are some factions that don't agree that this is the right thing to do that think that this is all nonsense um the biggest one that splits off at this time is probably rudolf steiner and and anthroposophy i think is what he calls it uh he had big disagreements over these ideas he felt that the theosophical society had become too um partisan with eastern philosophy and religion and that the western esoteric tradition was was being rich and and beautiful and yeah and it was being neglected so i think he took like 80 lodges of um in germany uh, of the theosophical side and broke off and formed his own organization which is essentially almost all the same ideas but it focuses more like on the mythology and symbolism of um like the Teutonic Knights and the, the search for the Holy Grail and yeah. Christian mysticism. What we would identify as the Western esoteric tradition, yeah. for example. So this whole structure of the nine levels of initiation might seem silly to some people. But let's put this into perspective, that if you look at Christianity, Catholicism, it's in many ways not very different. Like... Um, Paul, St. Paul talks about like the order of of the angels and the principalities and and basically what he's, or, what he's discussing is that there are different beings between us and God. There's a whole spiritual hierarchy of of beings in between us and God. And uh, they're at different levels and they have different functions, right? There's 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 even different orders of angels, right? Mm-hmm. That have different functions. Mm-hmm. I think there's seven orders of mm-hmm. angels. Yep. And so when you look at this, it's really not much different. It's different words, and um, it it has more of a maybe a a scientific kind of twist on it because of the influence of Darwinism at this point. But it's essentially the same order you see there. Well, it's interesting because so it's interesting that you bring up Paul because. The idea of the world teacher is really not, I mean, it's definitely derived from Christianity uh, because they saw Jesus as the latest incarnation of Lord Maitreya. Um, but it's really not all that far from early Christian kind of idea. So when you mentioned Paul, Paul believed that Christ was coming back like soon, like, <laughs> like very soon, like within 20 years, that he was going to come right back. And you know, have his vengeance upon the world and bring everybody up to heaven and everything. Paul, Paul was convinced that within a century, that the second coming of Christ would like, like that Jesus had stepped out for a moment and he would be coming back. So he was, he was very much his zeal kind of came from this idea that like, hey, we have limited time. Like this guy's coming back soon, and we all need to get right. So a lot of there are a lot of early Christian traditions that thought that Jesus Christ was coming back very, very imminently. They. The idea of a return of the world teacher was much more um, acceptable to people back then. I think now that we've had, you know, or at this point in the story, they had 1900 years of separation from Christ. The church was pretty comfortable in the idea that he wasn't coming back. So this kind of like became a, a more ridiculous idea. I mean, like, what's the what's the standard, you know, slander of somebody that starts saying radically uh, occult things now? Oh, he thinks he's the second coming of Christ. Yeah. Well, Christians thought that there was going to be a second coming of Christ. It's still well, in the I mean, Bible. It, it, like, it's it, still there. And many of them still do. Yes. And, and so this idea is really not as far-fetched as it seems. It's only because it's so close in history that we have, that we kind of think of ourselves as having the ability to criticize it. Well, I mean, look at Buddhism, right? I mean, um, Tibetan Buddhism. I mean, the Dalai Lama gets incarnated. They actually mm-hmm. send teams out when, when the Buddhists died to find children and like show them objects to see if they recognize the objects of, of their previous incarnation. Yeah, this is still happening right yeah. now. And, and 
and in, in terms of spiritual hierarchy, I mean, he, the Catholic Church has a pope, mm-hmm. right? And then they have cardinals. Who is supposed to talk to God. Like the Pope yeah. is the vicar of Christ on yeah, earth. He's yeah. supposed to have a direct line to God. So the, the idea of spiritual hierarchies is in almost, it, it is in every single religion, right? Mm-hmm. And you find it here in theosophy just organized maybe in a little more of a romantic way. At least I see it that way. You know, it, this is, it's, it's probably a little more imaginative mm-hmm. um, the way it's broken down. I, do these... Do all these like these Maha Shohans and world teachers and Manus, do they physically exist? I tend to think they're more symbolic in nature, but I certainly also believe that there are people if I because I believe in evolution. So I, mm-hmm. I can't think that every human being is on the same level. I mm-hmm. think there are some people probably that have become quite enlightened. Mm-hmm. And as a believer in reincarnation, why wouldn't they come back starting off? You know, knowing everything that they did from their past life. Well, we see it in our own lives. I mean, we all know somebody that's older and wiser than ourselves, right? As because they've been evolving for longer than us. Yeah. Like it's really, it's not that foreign of a concept, right? So anyway, so at this point, there is a a real push to to spread this idea, um, and it starts from within the Theosophical Society. Really, kind of Leadbeater takes up the charge on this one because. Uh, uh, Alcyon, as he's now known, which is his new name. That's uh, a star name. That's a star name. So that's that's what I was going to get into is the star name. So with Alcyon, uh, there are a kind of, there's this core group that Leadbeater starts saying, oh, Alcyon is, is this incarnation of this particular star. I think he takes for himself the name Sirius. And he starts giving out all these names um, to people in the inner circle of the Theosophical Society saying, We've all been involved together. This is where this kind of mythology that he it, built It's like your real from. name. Your yes. real name is Sirius. Your, so your soul name, essentially. Yeah. And, you know, Leadbeater is just this incarnation's name. But in all his incarnations, he's serious. Mm-hmm. And so Leadbeater kind of starts telling people that they're involved in this web. And, and people and the inner core of theosophy really starts to take to this. And so Leadbeater writes this book uh, that becomes pivotal to all of this called The Many Lives of Alcyone. Uh, it's a great book. I've read some of it. It's, it's very long, very dense. I haven't gotten through all of it. Um, but it kind of, so it not only introduces Alcyone as a spiritual character, but it actually sets out in a, in a narrative fashion, in a much more easily digestible fashion, the kind of cosmogony and story of theosophy so taking it back a little bit so with the secret doctrine blavatsky lays out the kind of like true secret history of the evolution of the world but it's an almost impossibly dense work it's so difficult to get through and and you have to have so much background knowledge to really understand it so what he does with the many lives of alcyon is he kind of tells a story of the spiritual evolution of the earth through the lens of Alcyon, who's this character who's been around since the beginning of time, basically. So the many lives of Alcyon actually starts with the Manu of the world, like actually creating the human race in this in this root race. And Alcyon is a member of this. And he, and he traces his lives going back, I think, 36,000 years. <laughs> like Alcyon has been reincarnating since before the days of Atlantis, right? And so... Not only does he introduce Krishnamurti as Alcyona and this whole thing, but also gives people a way of understanding the theosophical world. Well, he introduces also the the other people in the theosophical side who have been incarnating mm-hmm. and their star names. Yes, yeah, so he kind of this is uh, he's building a mythology here by which people can kind of like plug themselves into and really relate with with this idea. I think at the back of the book, there's actually like charts denoting all the different lives and the mm-hmm. star names and you know what their their names that we would know in history it's a fascinating read it's it's something sometimes we read around here on a winter night <laughs> by, by the, the fire. fireplace <laughs> um so from this book also it's it's very popular but a lot of people are like oh man this is a bunch of nonsense that he's just making up and, um, yeah, it should be said that so he's deriving all of this knowledge from sessions of clairvoyance, and and really that's where Leadbeater derives his knowledge is from sessions of clairvoyance. He he does clairvoyant investigate. So what's really interesting is uh, just to 
to give a, a bit of a pro lead beater side on this, he and Annie Besant uh, wrote a book called Occult Chemistry, I believe, where they mm-hmm. they use clairvoyance to investigate the subatomic plane of reality. And a lot of what they saw is very close to some stuff that was developed much later. They, I mean, they would draw out diagrams, yeah. and, and, and it's remarkably close to what people started observing. What we call quarks today. They had written about in like the very early yeah. 1900s. It's not completely accurate, but they actually they they said they they used clairvoyance to go inside um, the atomic structure and into the quarks, and they had uh, somebody drawing in the room of what they were describing. And those drawings, you can find them. They're very similar to what was discovered 50 years later. So. A lot of people in this day and age have a problem with the word clairvoyance, but there is some evidence that they were fairly accurate in some things. They so weren't. I, it didn't look like they were just making things. They up. They weren't just making things up. But they also didn't have the language or the background to completely understand what it was they were looking at. So the other thing that comes out of this time is at the feet of the master, which is a, a beloved book. It's very short. You can read it in three hours, and it was written by. Krishna Murthy, right? Um, and it's about the path of, of following the master. This book sort of became like sort of a Bible in the Theosophical Society. Um, and it was used by everybody. And, you know, they'd have a little like, you know, pocket, pocket versions. Yeah. And they'd read it on the train. They'd read it on their trips, you know, like people would with the Bible, right? Mm-hmm. And. Around this time, it's about, I think it's about 1912, 1913, the allegations of pedophilia, of misleading boys, rears its ugly head again. This time, it's a custody case. So Krishnamurti, when he was discovered on the beach, he was adopted by Leadbeater and Annie Basant. And the father agreed. So he was, he was receiving the best training and education and... Um, Years after that, the father was like, whoa, I don't like this. I want my son back. I don't know what they're doing with my kid. And it goes to a court in India, and it gets appealed to, to one of the highest courts in England, the Privy Court, uh, which I think would be similar to like what we call the Supreme Court. And um, the judge ruled that, that Krishnamurti would remain with Annie Besant that the father was not capable of taking care of him and that no wrongdoing had been done. And in terms, the, the, the father of Krishnamurti had accused Leadbeater of sexual acts with Krishnamurti. The judge said that there's no evidence that any of that happened. But he did chastise Leadbeater and say, you know, this man shouldn't be teaching <laughs> anyone's kids anything because, again... It's, it is still 1913. Yeah, yeah, it's 1913, and he shouldn't be teaching kids to masturbate and, and etc. So, again, it, it it he wasn't convicted in a court. It was, you know, it, it, was, it went to a court. It was appealed, and people are disgusted with his ideas, but they're not like that he touched anybody or that he did anything physical. And um, and Krishna Murthy never made those allegations either. No, at at the end of his life, I think an, uh, a reporter asked Krishna Murthy. This is like the eighties or something, nineteen eighties. You know, what about Leadbeater? Like, what do you think of him? And all he said was that he's he's a cruel and evil man. That's all that was said. Mm-hmm. Did something happen? Who knows? But. Le- There's sh- no it, evidence of it. It should be remarked that Leadbeater carried on the training methods of Blavatsky. Yes, and and people would think that the evil and the cruel refers to sexuality, but it was probably the fact that he was very hard on these boys. He he made them uh, study all day and all night and do their chores and work and work and work and and I mean this is the high Victorian era, so mm-hmm. it's like. People thought discipline was the most important thing. And, well, you could argue you, Krishnamurti turned out to be an actual world teacher. So, I mean, you can still be very upset with the people that, that forced you into greatness, but he, their methods were quite different 100 years ago. So he, he, again, you know, it was all over the newspapers, the you know, this trial, and, you know. One thing about Ledby was very interesting is that he never 
rebuked anyone. He never wrote any editorials saying that 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 these things weren't true that were being said. He almost just ignored it. He 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 was very serene this way. Like he just he went on doing his work and his duty and it just acted like none of this was ever happening. And it's a very unique sort of response, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it 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 takes a it really like a lot of people would say that oh we're just hiding from things but like it really does take uh, an immense strength of character to be lambasted in the public press like that and not and refrain from offering a response yeah. or getting into it. I think he he tried to hold himself above that because if he were drawn into the fight of it I I think he he saw no way of of winning or staying reasonable if if he were to descend to that level so he's just like look what's going to happen is going to happen i have what i perceive to be more important things to deal with and i'm just going to carry on living that way the year after this custody trial is essentially the beginning of world war one or one or two years i forgot it was 1913 or 1914 but world war one breaks out the great war and the theosophists took a very interesting stance you would think they may have been pacifists because we, we, I think we forgot to mention, but you know, theosophists tend to be vegetarian. They believed in protecting animals, um, and they don't believe in violence and anything. I mean, they're mm-hmm. they're very subdued that way. But in World War One, their perspective was very very unique. They saw um, essentially the Central Powers, you know, Germany, uh, Italy, the Ottoman Empire. Um, as you know, the leaders of those countries were the reincarnations of the brothers of the shadow, mm-hmm. right? These people that the, the evil people essentially that have been reincarnating over and over again since to bring, the fall of Atlantis. Yeah, they're yeah. the materialists coming mm-hmm. back to to bring selfishness and misery and strife and oppression and slavery to the world. So there's an interesting uh, article that Leadbeater writes at this time called "The Occult View of the War." And in it, they talk about him and and several other prominent theosophists are um, b- basically manifesting themselves on the astral plane and trying to investigate the causes of the war. And so they they actually end up, <laughs> according to Leadbeater, uh, astrally communicating with Otto von Bismarck and, and you basically deriding him in the astral plane, saying you know what you're doing is evil. And you know he they he details a conversation where you know Bismarck comes back and is like, no, this is for the glory of Germany. And they're like, no, you're an evil man. And you need to stop what you're doing. Um, so the Theosophists were very involved in in politics and in, in that sense. They thought that there were um, deeper kind of underlying causes for all of this that stemmed from their worldview. It was good versus evil. It was the empire of light versus the empire of darkness. And they saw England and the United States and France as being on um, you know, the, the forces of light and Germany, Italy, and the Ottoman Empire as the forces of evil. And And... They just believe that this war was not unique, that this war had been playing out for millions of years. That, that essentially that humanity fights one conflict and yeah. that it takes different forms yeah. f- every so often. So here finally, during World War I, um, Charles Ludbeater is initiated in Sydney, Australia. He's now living in Australia at what is called the Manor and he would die here uh, almost 20 years later. Um, he's initiated into Freemasonry. Uh, he had been reluctant to join at first, but after his initiation, passing, and raising ceremony, he said, wow. He saw all his past lives flash before his eyes, and, and it, the, the initiation ceremony had, had returned all his memories of having done this work, not only you know um, in the modern period, but essentially... Um, in ancient Egypt and mm-hmm. in Greece and in Rome. So he was reliving the initiations of the ancient mystery schools. He believed co-masonry was a direct descendant of the mysteries of Egypt. And he became very, very involved. He reached the degree of, of uh, Grand Inspector General of the 33rd degree. And he became very, very active. He opened many lodges. He presided over 18th degrees and 30th degrees. He wrote... He wrote two things. books on masonry specifically. Specifically, he wrote The Hidden Life of Freemasonry and Glimpses of, of, of Masonic History. Uh, both very good books. Um, but it also has the imagination and flair of Leadbeater. So <laughs> keep that in mind if you ever read them. But for him, masonry introduced a new aspect into 
the work of the Theosophical Society. He, he believed that they were um, that he was that the, all the work was coming together. So the Theosophical Society was sort of the intellectual branch, and that um, the world teacher and Krishnamurti was the religious branch, which they had then formed an organization called um, the Order of the Star in the East, or OSE, um, and that Masonry was this third part, which was um, ceremonial magic, right? Mm -hmm. And this is how it was hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago. This is what it was in the ancient mysteries. This is what it was in Atlantis. And um, all, all the pieces of the puzzle will now coming together to bring this new age together. And that's why eventually, you know, the new age movement comes out of this idea that we shouldn't confuse this with the new age because the new age movement hasn't started yet. But the new age comes to the idea that they're, they're basically creating this new age and it would be centered around masonry. It'd be centered around theosophical society and around the religion that Krishnamurti was going to bring to pass. Yeah. It, again, it cannot be understated that what we know is the new age movement and really all modern <laughs> occult and esoteric thought, it's all theosophy. It all comes from these people. I mean, you know, granted, there's there's a couple of fringe sources here and there, but really the Theosophical Society is the organization responsible for bringing these ideas to the Western mind. The, the fact that we can talk about any of this and have a shared understanding of it is because of the work of the Theosophical Society. And, and Leadbeater is a huge part of that. Well, and, and Universal Co-Masonry is essentially it, what, what makes it different and unique for those that have partaken it, is, is this theosophical infusion of spirituality. So masonry at this time in the greater world is more of a, it's a charity, it's a, it's a good old boys club. It, it has its spiritual past, but it was very much lost by this point. There were very few carrying that torch. But theosophy and co-masonry, they're like, no, this is a continuation of the ancient mystery schools. This, this is what they were doing thousands of years ago. And so... The, the theosophists involved in co-masonry started writing and focusing all their, their energy in, in, in bringing this, this new idea of what masonry should be. That, you know, in our rituals, we are performing magic. And that magic uh, helps the masters in their work. So we become conduits of energy. We become servants of the spiritual hierarchy. So this is where we get back to the idea of the, of the seven rays, right? And so... This, these organizations that Leadbeater was building were, they're, they're, they're kind of like, he's making them for the master of the seventh ray. He's, he's basically saying this, this energy is now what's coming to earth and they need vehicles to distribute this energy. This is a big concept of his in, in the science of the sacraments. Um, the book he wrote about the liberal Catholic church is that what the rituals of these organizations are are basically mechan they're, they're spiritual mechanisms by which this seventh ray energy can be manifested on earth. That all of the potential is there, but there are no avenues by which it can come into physical manifestation. So he sees it as his personal work to facilitate that energy coming to earth and, and infusing humanity. And so co-masonry is vivified by all of this. And, you know, even today, you know, there are very few theosophists in co-masonry, but the legacy of the work done a hundred years ago of, of the material written and the emphasis placed on the, on the ritual as being a magical experience lives on. Mm -hmm. And it's something I'm grateful for. I mean, I, I might be a theosophist in my heart, but I've never belonged to the organization or any of that, but their ideas live on. And it's really a fusion of the Western esoteric tradition and all its many, its many philosophies and sciences and ideas come together as the source of inspiration in something that we explore, that we research, that we discuss. And it's not that we're just doing pancake breakfasts and raising some money uh, for the local hospital. It's like, no, there's, there's a work here and we're, and we're doing it for the perfection of humanity. This is where Leadbeater's ability to build a mythology really, um, you, you can see its positive effects because he was always uh, blending things. To, he was bringing what seemed like disparate elements and knitting them together into one continuous story. And so what he did with masonry, he gave masonry a place in this theosophical kind of 
uh, world history, essentially, that this organization had been around before and would be again and was now at a, at a place where its its particular service was necessary to the world. So he gave people a, a place, basically. He, he placed masonry into the larger theosophical mythology that he was creating. And it helped, like you said, like co-masonry exploded around the around these ideas. It really, like, it really took off um, and found a home in the Theosophical Society. Many of the initiates from the 1920s up to the 1950s, it's it's all Theosophists. There, that those were the people that became interested in co-masonry, and Theosophy was a global organization. It really helped to spread the ideas of co-masonry. Well, in America, for example, um, there were, you know, under Louis Wazoo, there were many socialists and and uh, immigrants as part of co-masonry. But, but by the late 1930s, it's only theosophists. Mm. And if it wasn't for the theosophists, I don't think co-masonry would have survived in this country. So No, many of those more uh, secularly focused lodges that Wazoo founded in the early days he founded a ton of lodges, but many of them did not last. And this is my personal opinion here, but like, well, masonry devoid of spirituality, of purpose, of some part in the great plan of perfecting humanity, well, what's the point of it? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't need all this ritual to raise money for the local hospital. Like, yeah. in fact, it just gets in the way. Yeah, or to tell me to be a better man. Like, if that's the highest... If that's the highest um, teaching that your masonry has to offer, it's like, well, okay, great. Well, first of all, why am I even, why, why bother becoming a better man? Like, what does that even mean? And once I have become that, well, then what do I do? Like, do I just mm -hmm. hold more charitable event? Like, what does that, what does that mean? What's the purpose of this? And so really the theosophical interpretation of co-masonry gives masonry a mission. It, it lets us understand why we're doing what we're doing. To Leadbeater, ritual in, was so important, in fact, that he, there's a great little story that kind of illustrates this um, called The Seven Daughters of Java. So Java's in Indonesia today, and there was a huge comasonic and theosophical presence there. And um, he went to seven prominent families that had children, and he asked... Um, if he could train their daughters all about the same age, um, like late teens, um, in an elite ritual group. So for two years, these seven girls trained almost daily uh, with himself and some other people that he had appointed for this work. And their job was to, to be able to invoke the energies, to, to bring out the magic in the ritual. And he would then take this team of girls um, around to different cities after the two-year period, and, and they would do all the rituals. Leadbeater believed that in a ritual, um, it should all be really young people doing most of the work. So the floor work, like the deacons, uh, or the stewards, the inner guard, um, all these positions should be, should be done by young people. And uh, it's the older people that should be in what is called the column. So you're sitting kind of on the sidelines, what, what some people would say. But you see, to, co to these co-masons, they believed sitting in the columns, you became the receptors of this energy. Like you became the conduit of the work being done on the floor to be transmitted to higher powers, to the masters. So all the older people would be sitting watching, focusing, visualizing, praying, meditating, and then these young people will be doing this work. So he was training young people to be able to do the ritual perfect. But not just like in technique and skill, but in performance and in, in feeling and able to connect with the people perceiving in order to create the greatest amount of energy. So ritual was just so important that, that he, he was gathering these, these young people to do this great magical work of the ages. And, and he makes an interesting, um, that, that whole idea of, of having uh, the youth and the elders of a lodge kind of split along those lines, that the, um, that the elder brothers in a lodge are, are occupying the static position, so to speak, that they, that they act, that their uh, experience in masonry should grant them the ability to um, sit not only in the columns, but also in the chairs of the principal officers and, and the other officers that don't move, for like the secretary, the orator. These positions that require uh, less 
activity and energy and zeal and more uh, wisdom, stability, and, and kind of like the, the benefit of experience. And that, that the law should, obviously, you know, these, these are not hard and fast rules, but I think it is interesting that he identified this division among, among the brethren that, that once you reach a certain age and having been in masonry for so long, your skills are better spent elsewhere. And that the people that are still in the uh, younger phases of their development should be occupying these active kind of roles of movement and energy and, and zest, basically, for masonry. So he, he was very, very um, tuned into what ritual was accomplishing. And we'll see this in a moment because the next thing we're going to talk about is his involvement with the liberal Catholic Church. Real quick before we, we enter the uh, LCC, um, you know, the other thing is that as I had stated earlier, is that, you know, Annie Passant in 1903 um, had um, incorporated a, a new ritual for the British Federation, you know, after they created Human Duty Lodge in London. The, the rituals used by Le Droit Human in, in Paris were too uh, secular, they were too material-based, and they wanted something more spiritual. But they also didn't create new rituals, like I said. So the Dharma ritual was uh, performed in a lodge called Dharma in in India, and then it was used in Human Duty Lodge. So they sort of experimented with this in India, and it essentially is the emulation ritual used uh, by the Grand Lodge of England. Uh, but there were some preliminary ceremonies put in. Uh, there was some lighting of the candles. There was some sensing, and these were not invented by Theosophists for Theosophists per se, because these. Uh, type of ceremonies came from older Masonic rituals. They just sort of, they were kind of eclectically picking up the best and greatest things from older rites and then sort of incorporating them uh, into these preliminary ceremonies. And um, this Dharma ritual went through many revisions. And the the reason Leadbeater is important to this is that the fifth edition um, supposedly was penned by Leadbeater and by Wedgwood, who's another theosophist, co-mason. Um, actually, Wedgwood brought um, Leadbeater into the craft. He initiated him. I think he was master of the lodge uh, in Sydney. So they they sort of, they the, the Dharma rituals, 99% looks like what the male craft masons would have used in England. Uh, by the 5th edition, there were some significant changes, which is a ritual that became known as the Lauderdale Ritual, uh, which many people are familiar with today, but it's still practiced throughout the world. And this is the ritual that's accused of being the theosophical ritual, correct? It is, it is. And because they say, oh, the sensing came from the liberal Catholic Church. Well, it didn't. It actually, uh, Brother Karen Kidd has done some research into this, and she's found that it actually comes from an old lodge in the Netherlands, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So... They were very careful. I mean, they wanted to make it more um, church-like. Mm. Let's call it that more religious in its essence. But they didn't just make things up. Okay, so I, I say that because a lot of people, if you go to the internet and look up Dharma ritual, they're like, "Oh, it's the Theosophical ritual. Oh, lead beater. It's called the lead beater ritual." Mm. Well, lead beater didn't even write it originally. He wasn't even a mason until 1915, and it was first contrived in 1903. So he had nothing to do with it, right? Um, but I, I say this before we get into the liberal Catholic Church because they introduced these sort of elements of, of sensing and making it more of a religious experience. They brought hymns into it, but the hymns aren't new because the United Grand Lodge of England has been using hymns for their opening and closing of their ceremonies for centuries. Mm -hmm. So that's, they didn't invent that, but they reincorporated it and they took it in that direction. So that was 19, I think, 25, that that fifth edition. Now, supposedly, according to a paper I read by Brother Karen Kidd, uh, there was another edition that was submitted to the Supreme Council in Paris for approval that was even, even with even more changes. It was never approved, and I've never seen a copy of it. I would die to see a copy of it. So, having read, uh, having read some Leadbeater, particularly about the, the liberal Catholic Church and, and, you know, the science of the sacraments, which is kind of his, like, theological textbook on that. Um, it seems like he actually got a lot of ideas for the liberal Catholic Church from masonry. There's uh, several hymns that are used in, in that, in the Lauderdale ritual that seems like he, he brought over into the liberal Catholic Church. It actually seems to me, from what I've read, that the flow was going from masonry into the church and not from the church into masonry. Um, well, he joined... 
he became he was reordained a year after he was reordained in the liberal Catholic Church a year after he was made a Mason. So chronologically, you're right. So we should so we should explain what the liberal Catholic Church is and why it's a big deal for for Leadbeater. So. In 1916, uh, Wedgwood and Leadbeater, so James Wedgwood and uh, Leadbeater were the founding bishops of the Liberal Catholic Church, and they founded it in 1916. And with the Liberal Catholic Church, it sounds a little bit more radical than what it actually is. So the Liberal Catholic Church, they were using the term liberal in the sense of like, uh, in liberty, like in, in liberty of thought and Fr- Free thinker. Free thinker, not in the, in the terms of like left-wing politics that we might uh, connote that with today. So there, they saw that basically that uh, Christianity had deviated from its original uh, teachings. They believed that the Catholic Church was the one true church, um, that the Catholic Church was the line of apostolic succession that was ordained by Christ, and that that original church was what was meant to be um, the vehicle for Christian worship on earth. So again, this goes back into the idea that Leadbeater was very concerned with what ritual was being practiced because he he through his clairvoyant studies that we talked about earlier he would see the effects of these rituals and he and he would go to these different church services and he found that in catholicism the um the kind of like etheric vehicle that was constructed through the ritual was the most appropriate for channeling as much of that force as he possibly could. Like he said that Protestant services, for example, were very flat and didn't like, they didn't reach to the same heights that Catholic services did. So, and what the liberal Catholic church does is it's essentially the same as the Roman Catholic rite, but they, they trace their uh, lineage of apostolic succession back to the Holy See of Utrecht which is a church, I believe, in, in the Netherlands mm-hmm. that separated from the Roman church in the late 16th century. Um, so, and in, by basically disagreeing with some changes that the Catholic church made back then. So they, they say that they have retained uh, pure Catholicism. And so what Leadbeater did is they, they kind of they changed some of the wording um, is different between the Roman rite and the liberal Catholic rite. But it's essentially the same ritual. The big differences that they made was that they lessened the grip of Catholic dogma. So that's where the liberal part comes in. Uh, You could still believe in the theosophical worldview, for example, and still be uh, a Catholic in good standing under the liberal Catholic Church. You didn't have to believe Roman Catholic doctrine on everything. And his other big change that they made was that they removed references to the fear of God, uh, any kind of groveling in the prayer. They, they wanted to make it um, so that um, there was less of this kind of like, oh, Lord, have mercy on us. We're worthless. We're not worth you. You know, we're, we're worms beneath your feet. Please don't crush us. We're afraid of you. He removed all of that stuff because in his mind, uh, a loving God would not want his creation to be groveling in fear all the time. So that was so of of the changes that he made to the Roman ritual, those are really where he did any editing. Otherwise, it's basically Roman Catholicism before Va- the Second Vatican Council of nineteen fifty 1950, no nineteen sixty two. Otherwise, it's essentially the same. And this dovetails into co masonry and into the Theosophical Society is the third parts of, mm-hmm. of the of the, a three legged stool essentially <clears throat> that would bring to the world. The world teacher, Krishna Murti. And so essentially through the nineteen twenties, they're continuing to cultivate Krishna Murti, and he's kind of an awkward kid. And uh, but he's having to go to the liberal Catholic Church. Presumably he was a co Mason, though I've never found any record of that, but I, I doubt that he wasn't kind of He was at uh, least pushed into that. involved, yeah. And um, and of course he's the head of the Order of the Star in the East. So these three main forces had come together to to produce his arrival, and the movement had grown quite large. There were a lot of people that that believed he was the impending um, avatar, the avatar, the the of, of Lord Maitreya, mm-hmm. using his body as a vehicle. Um, but he was a bit awkward. He didn't really enjoy all the attention. Um, he got very nervous in front of crowds. Um, he didn't have the sort of charismatic personality that you would expect from someone that's supposed to be the world teacher, to be Lord Maitreya. <laughs> and um, 
things got worse. He he didn't want to really deal with Leadbeater. He he always had an affinity for Annie Bassam, and uh, you know, had a lot of affection for her. But uh, as we said earlier, he found uh, Leadbeater to be quite cruel, and it was probably through his teaching. Now a lot of people speculate that, um, you know, he was you know molested or touched or you know whatever, you know whatever you want to call it by Leadbeater, but. There's literally absolutely no evidence of that, and that's just speculation and rumor, and there's no... It never came from Krishnamurti, it never came from anybody else, those type of accusations. So, eventually we get to... We get to the the climax of the story here. The essential, the, the, the rise and fall of Charles Leadbeater. Um, the year is 1929, it's August... They're in the Netherlands at Star Camp at Amman, and um, there are 3,000 people, members of the Order of the Star in the East. They're ready to listen to the, their savior, to the avatar of Lord Maitreya, Krishnamurti, and he stands on the stage, and he says the following. I maintain that truth is a pathless land. And you cannot approach it by any path whatsoever, by any religion, by any sect. That is my point of view, and I adhere to that absolutely and unconditionally. Truth, being limitless, unconditioned, unapproachable by any path whatsoever, cannot be organized, nor should any organization be formed to lead or coerce people along any particular path. For two years I have been thinking about this, slowly, carefully, patiently, and I have now decided to disband the order, as I happen to be its head. You can form other organizations and expect someone else. With that, I am not concerned, nor with creating new cages, new decorations for those cages. My only concern is to set men absolutely, unconditionally free. You want to go along in the same old way, to have your masters, your gurus, your worships, your rites, your ceremonies, and to reconcile all these with what I am saying. You must be of no god, of no religion, of no sect. Bow down to no authority, past or present, for all authority is unproductive. Please, I mean everything I say. Don't go away afterwards and and say, he does not mean that. He means us to work for this particular church, or for that particular religion, or for these particular things. Those are excuses, because you cannot find the real. You could imagine the feelings Annie Basant and Ledbita were, were feeling as they heard... Krishnamurti say these words. They were there. They were listening to him. Many of the prominent theosophists of the time were there. Um, people were crushed. Um, you know, in terms of what he said, I think it's I think it's worth we stop here and kind of debate this a little bit. Um, it sounds very noble, and it certainly took courage and a lot of strength to disband the order that had formed all around him. Um, but I. You know, when I was younger, I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Uh, today, I actually think the opposite because he's basically saying, he's saying there should be no religion, there should be no God, there should be no paths, nothing. And and if you read any of his subsequent works, like Freedom from the Known, etc., etc., he basically he's is his style his style of teaching and his message and philosophy is. You shouldn't belong to anything. You should never do any ritual. You should just meditate every day, and it's all about you. It's really like it's, he's ushering in the postmodern era. He's basically saying that all these institutions created by man, by civilization, are worthless. They should be rejected. They're only here to control you. And it begins this, this fear that you know everything is a cult. Everything's a bad idea. Everything is there to enslave you. And... When, well, when I was a kid and, you know, postmodern, I thought that was, I thought he was the hero of heroes. Mm-hmm. And now I'm like, no, I think he was very scared of what had been thrust upon him. Nevertheless, he went on to write dozens of books. He went on to uh, become quite famous and give talks all over the world. So he continued the same work that, that he had been doing in the Theosophical Society. And an and interesting point here is that um, he continued to live at the cost of the Theosophical Society. Mm-hmm. So he, he's, he kept his homes. He kept his Rolls Royce. He kept his chateau in Switzerland. I, I really have very little patience for, for Krishnamurti's post-theosophy uh, philosophy. Uh, I, I do, I, even just reading that, um, 
I think his brand of relativistic kind of individualism um, is very is actually a, philosophically a turnoff for me completely. I don't think that that is very effective. I mean, I, we're sitting here after 60 years of the New Age movement, right, which is really kind of founded on these ideas that they're, you know, uh, do away with old authority structures, find truth for yourself, just meditate and everything, you'll, you know, you're going to reach the end of the path on your, on your own because there is no path and nobody can tell you what to do. Well, here we are 60 years later, and that has not been very effective. I don't think it has actually uh, led people to an understanding of the truth. I don't think that it has actually helped people in their lives. Um, whereas uh, organizations and institutions and ritual and ceremony and the idea of, uh, of a continuous tradition of seeking after knowledge, that does have a, a track record of helping people for thousands and thousands of years. And I, I, I look back at the latter half of the 20th century and I, I see that as a deviation away from what is healthy for the human spirit, not towards something that is greater. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think he just basically created a, a generation of theosophists that were disillusioned. I, I don't think he helped f free them, as he, his words said. I think he, he just made people sad and depressed and that they had, you know, that they had been duped by him. And um, I think when you're in a position that he was in, you have a responsibility to the people that are beneath you. And he basically said, leave me alone. And walk away, and you've been duped. And this was the high watermark of the Theosophical Society. It never, it never goes higher than this. I would say that this marks the beginning of the of the decline of the Theosophical Society. I mean, today, like, you know, God bless them, they're still around, but it's not even close to what they used to be. Um, in the in the time of Blavatsky and Leadbeater and Bassant, this is really, this is as high as the wave goes, and the tide goes out at this point in the theosophical society i don't even know if it's going to be around in 20 or 30 years frankly i mean they've, they've diminished so much in number and strength and they don't they don't say anything new it's just a repetition of new age ideas so i that you had brought in the new age and I, I think it's important here that we just we we really explain what that is the new age movement is a decentralization of spiritualism mm -hmm. and the ideas that came out of spiritualism so you become your own high priest you become your own prophet you become essentially the center of the universe and whatever you think is true is true you know i have my truth and you have your truth it's nonsense because i mean the word truth is singular like it's mm -hmm. it, it, it it's denotes one universal yeah. idea it, it's you we can't have different truths. we can have interpretations of truth we can have well i think the truth is you know x y and z and, and you can be no it's a b and c but the theosophists all believe truth was one and that we had to find it mm -hmm. and live it and, and that there was nothing higher than the truth. I mean, it's literally their motto. That's There's their no motto, religion right? higher than the truth. And then the New Age movement comes in using the same spiritual ideas, but making it very s selfish. It's mm -hmm. all about self-improvement. It's all about me. It's about my feelings. It's about, you know, what I think. And it's, it's very narcissistic, mm -hmm. the New Age movement. And it completely took all these ideas that had been incubating for 40 years. And instead of, a, you know, the New Age... Is not the new age they thought was going to happen. It was no. actually a new age of postmodern decay. Yes, yeah, no. There, there was a the new age movement was. Um, we're not fans. Was as you can't was tell. and is. Yeah, we're not a fan. I think it was a complete failure. Um, it's not, garbage. I think that it has done more to harm the spiritual health of humanity than it ever did to help. And and I think what co-masonry is doing now is helping to repair the wounds of of the self-centered new age movement. I think it's, I think it destroyed the momentum of human spirituality. I don't think it improved it. So in 1907, when Annie Besant took command of the Theosophical Society as the outer head, uh, there were 567 Theosophical Lodges worldwide. By 1928, just before Krishnamurti made his declaration, uh, his abdication of power, but I'll call it that, there were 1,571 launches. There were three times as many launches. By 1933, they were down to 1,279. So 300 lodges disappeared within four years of his declaration. So it certainly had an impact. And today, I would probably argue there aren't a hundred. Oh, I guess a hundred active theosophical yeah. lodges? That'd be a stretch. Yeah. Yeah. So the Theosophical Society was crushed by this. And... Annie Besant was crushed. 
and mm-hmm. Leadbeater were crushed. Both of them would be dead within, within five a couple years. Of years. Yeah, yeah. He died in thirty four, but I think she died in thirty three. Yeah, right. They, it's him. interesting the two of them, the, the, these allies, they died within a year. What's interesting is that the writings of Annie Besant portray her, her, you know, her depression on mm-hmm. the matter, her, her unhappiness, her sadness, her regret and remorse. Leadbeater doesn't miss a beat. <laughs> Typical Leadbeater. <laughs> he just keeps going. He yeah. just keeps going. He's holding co- comasonic meetings. He's you know liberal Catholic priest. He just keeps going. But it must have affected him because mm-hmm. again they didn't live much longer past this point. No, and 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 really, Krishnamurti was their life's work. They they really thought that this was going to be their contribution to the world. Was that I mean, Leadbeater Leadbeater found him, and and regardless of what Krishnamurti thought of him at the end of his life, I mean. The reason Krishnamurti was who he was was because of Annie Besant and Charles Leadbeater. There's no deny. I, I doubt even Krishnamurti would deny that, that, that he was plucked from obscurity by these two and made into what he was. So it really, uh, it's kind of a sad ending to the tale that, they, that their entire uh, life's mission came to an end in such a tragic way. So Leadbeater died on February 29th, 1934, like, couple weeks after his birthday um he died at 4 15 p.m and he died in sydney in australia and he sort of died as he lived right he was he was surrounded by close theosophists and co-masons and members of the liberal catholic church and his last words were well if i do not see you again in this body carry on the work (laughs) <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> in typical Leadbeater fashion, he resigned the mortal plane, encouraging everybody to continue working. There'll be, you know, after his death, uh, there's people that say they, you know, they saw his astral projection on on the physical plane, and uh, many declared. <laughs> I'm sure they're not be, wrong. Either. I'm yeah, sure he came to check up, make sure people were still working. He, you know, they declare that he's already been reincarnated again. I mean, who knows of, of any of that, but. So, you know, looking back at Charles Leadbeater, we cannot deny the impact this man had on humanity, for better or for worse, uh, depending on, on how you're looking at his work. One thing that I've read in explanation to the accusations, because that, that always kind of rears its mm-hmm. ugly head over and over again, even to this day, um, is you know uh, Gregory Tillett, who wrote a, a, a great biography that I recommend to everybody called The Elder Brother. Um, Good. His conclusion is that, that Leadbeater, when he was a member of the confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament, that secret or- organization within the Anglican Church, um, sex magic. Um, not what we'd perceive as sex magic, but that the idea is that... Um, in masturbating, um, what the Victorians called self abuse, mm-hmm. right? Uh, there was a power to connect to the highest. That the that orgasm mm-hmm. um, that occurs between a man and a woman that that leads to the creation of a child, if done with oneself, can allow you to access God. So, Gregory Tillich kind of kind of explores this idea there's there's no way of definitively proving this but that what he was teaching all these other boys was that they essentially could reach heightened levels of occult powers by not masturbating to the imagery of beautiful women but but masturbating with the intent of raising their kundalini of mm. of of raising um the energy that in, within their within their seven bodies from the lowest to the highest and that this is how you gained clairvoyancy. Um, it's an interesting theory because it explains why he was giving out all this this instruction, and he was doing it in secret because it wasn't for everybody, and it was something he had learned in the church. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I mean, what do you think about that, Brother Axel? Well, Kundalini Yoga is very much connected to tantric yoga and the and those kinds of practices. So it's not. It's not exactly uh, too much of a leap to say whether he discovered it in the Anglican Church or whether he discovered it in, um, you know, his time training in yoga in, in Adyar. It's difficult to say. I, I could see 
I could see both being true. Um, it strikes me as more likely that he this is what he was doing um, because it does kind of fit in the vein of what we knew what we know he was writing and thinking about. Um, but I guess it, it's one of these questions that will never be that will never be settled. I mean, on the other side of of this argument is that he. He was probably homosexual. Mm-hmm. I mean, he didn't have any. He, he never got lived married. a bachelor lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, and and he was closer to men than women. Yes, the most definitely. So I mean, he may have just been living in a repressive era where he wasn't able to be openly homosexual uh, in England in the Theosophical Society, and so that's why you know all these ugly rumors kind of were created around him because he was engaging in in some acts of just. Being himself, which today would be absolutely normal, mm-hmm. but back then it was not. It, it was, was not at all, and, and and in fact, there was a uh, a strain of the Theosophical Society that was particularly against um, homosexuality. Like the Alice Bailey camp, for example, was um, they wrote a lot about homosexuality and, and what a sin it was at that time. So there were factions even within his own society that would not have accepted him for coming out and living that lifestyle. He also did mention in some of his writers, uh, his writings, excuse me, uh, the uh, the idea of pederasty, mm-hmm. which was you know very common in, in the Greco-Roman culture, in which an older man, you know, somebody of wealth and and education, would take sort of an apprentice, uh, which would be a young man in, in his in his late teens, and um, there was a sexual element uh, between the apprentice and the master, so to say. Um, one would be imparting wisdom and understanding, and the other one would be um, fulfilling the needs of the older gentleman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, he there again. There's evidence, uh, kind of on both sides, but ultimately, it's he gets dismissed because of these accusations that are made, uh, and I think wrongly. I think he had a lot of very interesting things to say. He lived a hundred years ago. I don't know if I would agree with everything that he thought or, or what he was like as a person. Maybe he was a cruel and evil man. Um, but the legacy of Leadbeater should be his undeniable contribution to the occult and esoteric world. I mean, he furthered esoteric thought more than more than most people that have ever even engaged in that activity. He His ideas are responsible for a lot of what people think about occultism today and they don't even know it. And I think his contribution goes undervalued because of these accusations. In, in one final idea that I think we should bring up, um, you know, in, in these day, in these years after the debacle with Krishnamurti, he, he still had many students and he was in the park by the manor in Sydney walking in a, in a garden uh, with several uh, pupils and... Um, he was talking about the, the devas that were in the air, the, the angels that he mm-hmm. could see. And one of the students like, well, Master, I don't see any, I don't see any of this. And he says, oh, okay, well, the problem is you haven't imagined them. And he, this, this, the student ends up writing about this experience, but Leadbeater essentially taught that um, there was an occult truth, but if you weren't able to see it, you had to use your imagination to see it. And this is a very interesting idea because we, we, we tend to think that, you know, in the occult world, like you're just going to see all this stuff with your naked eye. But you don't, you know, auras, for example, they're, you can't see them with your eyes. They're not on the visual spectrum. Mm-hmm. Auras is something beyond that. You see it with your third eye. You see it with your spiritual eye. And so what Ludbeater was, was teaching, apparently, a lot of these people was the, the, the idea that you had to imagine these forces. You had to imagine the angels. And once you had they would materialize. But this type of teaching is found in early Christianity. It's found in Buddhism and Hinduism, where you know different gods of the, of the Hindu pantheon would be visualized in meditation for years until the god would come alive. Isn't this a... It's also a concept in, in Greek philosophy, too, this idea of cultivating your daemon, that, the, that there was this like connection to these invisible worlds that you were supposed to cultivate and, and in doing so you'd receive ideas from the from you know higher realms of, of thinking that you weren't necessarily um, 
awake to in your kind of mundane consciousness. You have to create a bridge. Mm -hmm. The assumption that you're going to see everything in the invisible worlds doesn't make sense because they're invisible worlds, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. All the things that religions talk about are, are is on the other side of materiality, right? So the only way to access them is to create a bridge. And he believed, as other cultists did, it's the imagination that's the key to crossing the bridge. Thank you for listening to Legends of the Craft. This podcast is purely the opinion of brothers Matthias Comcier and Axel Suvari and does not represent the official views of Universal Comasonry. Universal Comasonry is a Masonic order founded on the principles of liberty, equality, and fraternity that admits men and women without distinction of race, religion, or creed. For more information, please visit universalfreemasonry.org.